Good day, ladies and gentlemen. You're gonna love this interview I just recorded with Father David Sherry. Sort of the truck driving by right there. Um, we talked about everything to do with the SSPX, schism, obedience, um, and we got into the more controversial topics that have more to do with, uh, I would say, not the doctrinal stuff, but sort of the positions the SSPX has taken on the vaccine. Um, and uh, lockdowns and uh, abuse allegations and that sort of stuff. And those things are, you know, a lot of traditionalists have no problem with the SSPX as the society. They, they don't believe they're in schism, that sort of thing. But there were some who thought they were soft on things to do with the vaccine, for example. Maybe there's been uh, a sordid past of mismanagement of abuse allegations. We actually address those things. And Father Sherry is a superior of the Canadian district, which is obviously a massive district for the Society of St. Pius X, uh, addresses these things. And we attack them forthrightly and discuss them charitably. And it's a wonderful conversation. He's a great man, friend of the family. It was a pleasure to have him on. Now, one of the things about the SSPX is priests are not allowed to have beards. So I have not asked Father Sherry this, but I think he would agree with me that if he was allowed to grow a beard, he'd probably enjoy TKR beard products. Go to thekennedyreport.com and visit the TKR store to see our new products, Kennedy's Choice Beard Oil. You can use this on your beard to help with alleviating itchiness, dryness, and irritation of skin. And don't worry, no animals were used in testing this product except for myself. Use Kennedy's Choice Beard Balm for a softer, healthier, manageable beard that is made with natural ingredients. And trust me, I know a thing or two about beards. Visit thekennedyreport.com and check out the TKR store. The links for this are in the description. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. You're witnessing the first in-person podcast I've done like this. So I'm producing it myself. So it should turn out pretty good. And I've got Father Sherry, District Superior of Canada here. Father, thanks for coming on. Thank you very much for having me, Kennedy. Great we, pleasure. We've uh, done virtual ones before, many times in person speaking and spending time, but not recording right yes yeah, yeah. i think we uh, we may have done uh, a couple of short videos about halloween we did for the fatima center <laughs> a few That's years right. ago yeah 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 but this is this is going to be exciting so we're going to talk about everything whatever you want but um obviously the society of saint Pius X, um and uh, we thought we might address some of the tougher questions um if that's all right with you and uh, we can hear, rather than just sort of the news media opinion, we can hear the actual SSPX opinion. Um, but first, um, I don't know if our audience knows who you are. Some of them will. But why don't you give us a background of who Father Sherry is? Uh, did you grow up in tradition? Why did you choose the SSPX? Sort of how did you end up where you are? Okay, yeah. So um, I was born in Ireland, in uh, the great uh, county of Cavan. Okay. And uh, I grew up uh, with uh, my parents, five siblings. Um, we uh, grew up, I suppose, in in the Novus Ordo. Uh, we were quite uh, quite close to the local church there, and uh, we played a fairly big part in in the parish. With uh, my mother was the organist, and uh, you know we served and sang and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, however. Um, my parents had sort of, with the help of a, a lady who lived not too far away, they had sort of spotted that there was some, something not quite right, something, uh, something strange example. Um, you know, why is it, for example, that, uh, one week, uh, you do not receive communion on the hand and the next week you have to receive communion in the hand. Uh, why is it at school, Catholic school, uh, that children are not really being taught the catechism anymore, but rather sort of very dumbed down versions of the catechism, even being taught that all religions are now okay? Why is it uh, that uh, really the faith is not being passed on? So this this old lady, in fact, was was remarkably well tuned in. This is back in the 70s, and she was able to tell them about Archbishop Lefebvre and what uh, he was doing to uh, continue tradition, continue the, the traditional mass. And so, you know, once in a while, they would go to the traditional mass in Dublin. In, in those days, the 
um, Society of St. Pius X would fly in a priest every so often and have mass in a, in a music hall in mm -hmm. Dublin. And um, eventually, um, you know, this, this, I suppose this went on for, for years, and uh, eventually, you know, a couple of things happened, let's say, and uh, it sort of clicked with them that uh, if you want to keep the faith, you need to be going to a traditional parish where you have the traditional mass and the faith is actually being passed on, as opposed to... A Novus Ordo parish, where, of course, we know some good things may be happening. There may be a good priest, uh, there may be uh, devotion, uh, but it's most likely that, in fact, the faith is not really going to be passed on. And, of course, that's obvious in the huge numbers of people who have just fallen away from the faith. So, to cut a long story short, after, um, I suppose when I was about 12, we, we uh, started going regularly to the traditional mass. And how old are you, Father? I am now 42. Okay, so, so that was 30 years ago. Yeah. So you were started going in then, I guess I was born in 1988. So you started going based around 1990? Yeah. 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 Well, even uh, before that, we, as I said, we were going on and off. Right. But you know how it is that you're 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 always trying to um, make it work in your yeah. parish. Yeah. Uh, the good and perfectly normal Catholic instinct is not to start looking for some roving priest going around who's, uh, you know, I'm going to do everything you need and sort of abandon your parish. You want to stick with the priests whom God has sent you. And uh, But when that became obvious, let's say, that um, it's not really a good way or a safe way of, of passing on the faith to your children and then to their children, for, for those who marry, um, then you, you 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 have to, I think, look for a traditional parish. And that's what happened, yeah. And then um, there was a story, there was a breaking point when your mother was yeah. kneeling for communion, right? Well, that, this is, it's part of it. This, right. this was, yeah, this was one of the things. It's, uh, my mother was, was expecting a, a child and uh, I think it you, might have been me, in fact. You come from eight, nine? Uh, six children. Six children. Six okay. children, yeah. So um, around that time, you know, the new rule came in. So uh, we're now going to stand for Holy Communion. Yes. Now, you know that the reason we kneel for Holy Communion is because it shows reverence. Of course. <laughs> so now we're going to stand for Holy Communion. And of course, it can be legitimate to stand for Holy Communion. Um, they do in the East. Right. But that's their tradition. And they don't, it's a different... Well, you see, that's the thing is that, let's say, the priest stands for Holy Communion. He does not yes. kneel down to receive Holy Communion. So what you're doing there is you're actually, uh, you know, everything in the liturgy of the church is symbolic. You're expressing the truth and the correct uh, attitude towards God by your actions. So an old lady who's in a wheelchair, she sits for Holy Communion. Yeah. And that's perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, however, kneeling, and kneeling is not some sort of... Uh, you know, Western invention. This is all throughout sacred scripture. Um, you know, our Lord knelt in, in the garden of, of mm -hmm. olives and uh, St. Uh, St. Paul knelt, etc. Mm -hmm. St. Stephen. So it, what is it? it means something. It mm -hmm. means that you're adoring. That's right. what kneeling means. So if you say, well, okay, we're going to replace kneeling by standing. Okay. Why? Right. Uh, well, because I can't kneel anymore. Oh, well, that's Okay. Mm -hmm. Or it's because, no, well, now we're going to uh, actually have a sort of a different attitude towards uh, the Mass. We're going to have a different attitude towards Holy Communion. We're going to adopt, in fact, what the Protestants adopted. Mm -hmm. uh, although you might have spotted that uh, King Charles uh, at his coronation knelt for Holy Communion. Did he kneel? <laughs> well, actually, I was, it was very funny because, you know, in, in Quebec, uh, in Quebec, you know, the big thing is uh, the priests... Uh, Ils disent la messe en latin do au peuple. So uh, yeah. they're saying mass in Latin with their backs to the people. Yes. And it was quite funny, I thought, because, uh, I mean, I didn't watch the whole coronation ceremony or anything, but I, I, I just had a quick look. Yeah. And uh, the, the sort of Eucharistic prayer of the Anglican service, the bishop had his back to the people. So uh, I'm saying, yeah, so this is uh, this is interesting. So it's it's not, uh, there's something other than just turning your back on the people. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's it's facing God. Mm -hmm. It's That's what it is. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's it's really 
I suppose the thing with the, the Novus Ordo Mass is, well, we're going to take out lots of things. We're going to change lots of things. Why? Yeah. And the reason we know what sort of uh, animated the whole um, liturgical changes of the 60s and afterwards is, well, we need to remove from the liturgy what could be a stumbling block for our separated for the brethren. Yeah. Well, and we should mention, too, because there's going to be some people who will say, again, they, they stand in the East. Right. Well, and I've always said this, Vatican II, the, the spirit of Vatican II has used the East as the, you know, explaining away all the problems because, mm-hmm. well, they do in the East. Well, what they do in the East, they don't do in the West. And they and in the East, they don't want Latinization. In right. fact, what's why the Eastern Catholic churches view Vatican II as, in, in, at least for their perspective, a kind of a triumph, because there was this, uh, in their opinion, encroaching Latinization. And it stopped. And fair enough. The East is different than the West, and they're different lungs of the church, if you want to call it that or whatever. But when you stand for Holy Communion in the East, it's part of a larger tradition where all of these acts of obeisance and the incensing and the, the vessels and things like that. So uh, in, in their perspective, they stand because sort of uh, they stand when the king enters the room sort of thing. And that's the idea. And that's great. But they do everything else very differently, so it makes sense there. When right. you just insert it into the West, it makes no sense, and it's obviously not to become Byzantine; it's to become open to Protestantism. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's sort of uh, used as an excuse. Yes. Okay. So so because you could actually say, well, no, we're going to introduce uh, standing because that actually expresses more correctly the attitude of the uh, Christian towards his God. Right. But of course, it doesn't. It doesn't. For in, in, in the Roman liturgy, mm-hmm. it does not express yeah. the uh, adoration. The priest stands for Holy Communion because he is the minister of Christ. He's, he's actually being used by Christ as the priest. Mm-hmm. As, so he's, uh, he's expressing this sort of, uh, this sort of uh, unique role he has as the mediator yes. between God and man. And so he stands. And uh, just an interesting one there. It's it's like the difference between French and English. Okay, so in 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 French, if you're very familiar with somebody, you, you use the two form, yeah. right? And then if you're being respectful, you use vous. Yeah. But in English, it's completely the opposite. Yeah. If you're just talking to somebody, you say, "Hey, you're doing this," and if you were to say, "Thou dost this," it's yeah. a, I mean, it's it's dated now. Yeah. But it's a sign of respect. Yeah. So if you were to say, well, you know, I think that we should uh, remove the uh, vu for God because we want to be more like the English, well, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So that's why it is just an excuse. You're saying, well, you know, in certain parts of the world, uh, people, uh, you know, they do not have the mass in Latin. Yeah. So why should we? Right. But there's a reason why we have the Mass in Latin, and it's the same reason why in the East they have the Mass in whatever language. Greek or Slavonic yeah. or whatever. So well, it's yeah. by saying, oh, well, we should change it because they don't have it. Well, of course, Mass in Latin is not something which was commanded us by God, mm-hmm. but it's something which, through the uh, wisdom of the centuries, and, you know, uh, Kennedy, John the Twenty Third <laughs> wrote a... He did. He wrote a, it's not an encyclical, I think it's an apostolic letter or something about why Latin is kept in the Roman liturgy yeah. and why we should keep it. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the Pope who called the council. Yeah. So when people say, you know, John Twenty Third wanted to get Latin out, well, no, he didn't actually. No, he did not. Anyway, uh, the thing is that uh, you, you, we have Latin because it is a universal language mm-hmm. of the church. It's also a language which immediately unites us to the beginnings of the Roman church. Mm -hmm. It's a language which is the same everywhere and throughout all time. Mm -hmm. You know the way language is changing now? (laughs) Imagine if we were... What is a woman? (laughs) Well, exactly. So the thing about Latin is you can open up, if you've learned Latin, uh, you know, you can open up the writings of St. Augustine and it's not like reading Beowulf. Right. You no, know, if you're trying to read Beowulf, you've got no idea what it means. You've got to read a translation. That. Yeah, and so it, it the, the Catholic Church is universal. Mm-hmm. So it's all people of all nations of all times, and this is a way as a sort of a, a lingua franca mm-hmm. to make everybody one. Like you go down to your local church, let's say maybe in Toronto, right? Um, there's people there from Asia, mm-hmm. from the Philippines, from Africa, from all over Europe, Poles, Portuguese. And so they come. 
And now what you have is, okay, well, we're going to be having the Portuguese mass at such a time, and then we're going to be having the French mass at another time, and the English mass, and you divide up all these people. Whereas, in fact, you've got the Latin mass, everybody's right at home. A lot of people don't realize, because uh, in traditional Catholicism, the parishes are not bifurcated into different ethnicities, we're all the same one, our potlucks are much better than other parishes. <laughs> I like Filipino food, and so the Filipino parish is going to have only Filipino food. Sorry to hear food. that, Kennedy. No. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, at ours, we're going to have all the types. That's one reason to go to traditional. That's right. Yes, I have to uh, thank uh, the traditional uh, parish in Canada for introducing me to the wonderful food called pierogi. I've never, you never had that? never had that before. That's uh, quite That's something. Polish. I think it's um, Ukrainian Pol or is po Polish. Polish. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's... No, but it, it's, it's very beautiful. It's very beautiful because, I mean, I remember... Uh, you know, just some of some particular parishes in big cities, yeah. in particular, you know, you could be really anywhere in the world, mm -hmm. and everybody's at one. Everybody's singing the Kyrie, everybody's singing the Gloria. Um, the obviously the language of the sermon is yeah. going to be in whatever the language of the city is, but everybody more or less, you know, has some knowledge of that language, mm -hmm. and it, there's such a sense of unity. Whereas. Of course, if you're saying, well, we've got the Portuguese group and we've got the Irish group, etc., well, we're Catholic. Yeah. We are all united in the one faith. Then all of the national customs, mm -hmm. they're great. Yeah. But we're all one, really. Well, by, by the faith. By the in faith. The, in the past, you know, uh, before the council, you'd have French and Irish and stuff parishes, yeah. but that was more of an ethnic thing, but the mass was still the same. Yes. They'd go where they can understand the sermon, yeah. but the mass was the same, right? Mm -hmm. And that's also very unique to. Uh, diaspora populations mm -hmm. obviously mm -hmm. yeah. historically everyone's speaking the same language anyway uh this idea of of moving to a different country and being in an ethnic enclave where you don't learn the language for many many years is kind of a uh, kind of a relatively modern thing mm -hmm. right because of the way that we live now so it's yeah but um so why then so you started going traditional your mother I don't know if you finished the story, but I believe she was kneeling. Yeah, so what happened yeah. was that, uh, so the, the rule came in, uh, okay, got a kneel for communion. She's eight months pregnant, I think. Yeah. Um, obviously, I don't remember it, but uh, so she decides she's going to kneel anyway, because you know that uh, traditional Catholics, even if they're not actually going to traditional mass yet, you know, they're very, very disobedient. It's in their bones. Yeah, yeah it's in their yeah. bones. So they uh, Rebels. So she, she there, there's a supermarket queue now. Instead of kneeling at the altar rail, the supermarket queue up the, million, up the middle. Mm -hmm. So she kneels down, and the priest decides to refuse her Holy Communion. Now, if you think about that for one second, um, normally you're only allowed to refuse Holy Communion to someone who is either not a Catholic mm -hmm. or else excommunicated yeah. or, you know, grossly immodestly dressed, let's say. Yeah. But anyway, so she's there, and of course, because she's heavily pregnant, she's uh, stranded. And so she's embarrassed uh, by the priest and has to be helped up uh, because there's no altar rail anymore to, to, to support you. Yeah. So there you go. That's I, I mean, it's not that she said, okay, that's it, I'm never setting foot back in here again, because of course, that could be a bit of a wounded pride as well. Yes. But it's more like one element in putting a question mark saying, well, how is it that you had to kneel for the past sort of um, you know two thousand years, right. but now now you won't you even get, now you won't even now you won't even distribute to me. Right. It's not like I'll talk to her after mass and say this isn't our custom now. Right. It's you are basically a dog. Please leave. That's what the feeling is <laughs> well, like. It's sort of you know you hear yeah. lots of stories about this where in certain places priests saying okay I'll give you holy communion when you're kneeling but come up last yes. or whatever it might be. And you say well why. You know why? As it, let's say, if if standing for Holy Communion is now showing more reverence, which it isn't, yeah. Um, how is kneeling not showing reverence? Yeah. So it's it sort of it puts the sort of number of question marks. There's other things as well. I remember my my sisters, for example, were at a convent school uh, run by the Loretto nuns, mm -hmm. and uh, Mother Teresa was an Irish Loretto, Loretto originally. She, wasn't she 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 was indeed. Yeah, yeah. she uh, spent a year, I believe, in in Dublin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, um, class retreat, mm -hmm. um, we're going to have a discussion about abortion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so girls get to decide, are you for or against abortion? And that's it. No guidance. <laughs> no, uh, no telling by the uh, person running the retreat, okay, well, you know, here are the logical reasons why abortion is actually against the natural law. Abortion being understood as the direct and uh, intentional killing of an unborn child. Mm -hmm. 
uh, not a miscarriage or something that's caused accidentally. Um, and then, for example, um, I remember on one occasion that they were going to confession, so which is uh, which is a good thing yes. to to get the young people to encourage them to go to confession. But they're told uh, you can only tell one sin, okay, okay which is handy for the priest in one way because uh, that speeds everything up. But uh, so anyway, so so my sister comes home and she says to my mother, um, "Yeah, we were going to confession today. We we're told to just say one sin." So so my mother calls up Reverend Mother. Uh, what happens if hypothetically a girl had two mortal sins? You know, what would she do? And the Reverend Mother replied, "Oh, we never talk to them about mortal sin." <laughs> so this is teenage girls, you know. So it's uh, so that all of that. It's sort of. Yeah. Uh, I mean, these are stories everyone has, and absolutely, and, absolutely, yeah. and um, a lot of people, a lot of people will agree with this, but then they'll say to themselves, "Okay, well, you know, fair enough. The SSPX was there in Ireland as a refuge and stuff, but then why would you decide to go into the Society Seminary? Okay, because because you went entered the seminary." A, Around the year 2000? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, yeah. so this is obviously before, after 1988, when the alleged excommunications take place and so mm -hmm, forth. Mm -hmm. And ladies and gentlemen, we're not going to necessarily do a massive apologetic for all of the ins and outs of all possible things. That's why you can see on the screen here the book that I wrote, same Shameless Plug, is available. Um, we do that there, but just for the sake of conversation, there's a controversy yeah. In, around the year 2000. This is before 2009, where it's obvious there's no excommunications and so forth. Why did you choose to go to the SSPX rather than the Fraternity Institute or another? I don't know if there are. Was the Good Shepherd around yet then? No. No, yeah. So those are only two based at the time. Maybe the Oratorians. I know they kind of do the Reverend Novus Ordo Latin Mass thing. Mm -hmm. So why did you decide to go to the SSPX? Well, uh, why did I decide to go to the SSPX? Well, first of all, why did I decide to be a priest? Uh, mm -hmm. So... Um, obviously that's God's mystery. Right. He, he calls whom he wills and the objective call to be a priest takes place on the day of your ordination when the right. bishop calls you. Can you break that down for a sec just quickly? Because a lot of, I know growing up in the Novus Ordo, formed in the Novus Ordo, the idea of being a call to be a priest was like you found a corner in your soul where like you were meant to be a priest from all time mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. But that's not traditionally how we understand it that is not the definitive sign of a vocation. So very shortly, uh, Kennedy, uh, to be a priest or to follow any vocation, you need to have the aptitudes. Mm -hmm. So you need to have the physical, moral, intellectual aptitudes for whatever the vocation might be. So if I'm going to be a Dominican, for example, I'm probably going to need to be a lot more intelligent than I am because they, you know, that's their, they're the order of preachers. Right. They study and they preach. Um, but uh, so if you have those, then you also need the desire. Mm -hmm. In other words, it, it's God calls, but you've got a free choice. So Matthew chapter 19, God says to the young man, uh, our Lord says to the young man, come follow me. Right. Okay. It's up to him. He, in fact, does not uh, follow the call. So that's why the, I think what people are, are mixing up perhaps is that the sort of, uh, you know, feeling, it's not a feeling, it, it's a desire that I wish to offer myself to God, to do his will, to be a priest or a brother, to get married, whatever whatever your vocation might be. Vocation in that sense being understood as the role that God wants you to play in the mystical body. So um, so why did I want to be a priest, offer myself to be a priest, mm -hmm. uh, is because effectively with, with God's help, I figured out that, well, the most important thing in life is to save your soul. Therefore, the most the most valuable thing that I could do is to help people save their souls. That's okay, basically. It. So, uh, I remember actually I went to a, a Novus Ordo Catholic uh, high school, and I remember being asked by the career guidance counselor, you know, what do you want to do, and I I didn't know. So I said, I'm thinking maybe I might want to be a priest, and he said to me, um, that's good, but you need to understand that a priest unites God with man and man with God. That's what that means. I say that's pretty good advice. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. So that's why I wanted to be a priest. And then, <clears throat> I mean, this is this is part of the answer. Is around the time that I uh, was thinking of actually going to the seminary, uh, I watched a documentary on RTE. Now RTE is the uh, state propaganda oh, the service yeah. for 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 Ireland. And uh, I mean, it used to be fairly good. The first thing they ever broadcast on RTE was Benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. Oh wow! And that was back in '62. Uh, and the then uh, president of Ireland, President de Valera, said, you know, this is great, but be careful 
because this can be used for great good or for great evil. Of course, absolutely yeah. right. It's BBC, CBC, they've all done the same thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Except I would just say this, that the difference between the BBC and the CBC is that the BBC do their propaganda with class. They do. <laughs> Those documentaries have very nice music, even if they're communist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great uh, yeah. posh voices, whereas CBC is sort of, you know, they're constantly heading you over the head with, uh, with it's propaganda. It's stupid, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, RTE broadcast a documentary about, you know, it's just about the time when these sort of um, real-life fly on the wall documentary started yeah. where you follow somebody's life. So they followed the life of a number of seminarians mm. in the big seminary in Ireland called Maynooth. And uh, so it was, what was particularly interesting is that in the seminary, you know, uniting God with man and man with God was not, didn't really seem to be what they were preparing for. It was more, you know, we're going to be, um, you know, helpful in the community. Yeah. We're going to be nice guys in the community. And there didn't seem to be a real sense of how the candidate for the priesthood should become as holy as possible. Uh, you know that you don't have to be a priest to be holy. All men, all all women, all boys and girls are called to holiness. Mm -hmm. Um but clearly, if you're going to be another Christ, then you should strive to avoid vice and to practice virtue. So that they, they show in the seminary uh, bedrooms, or the bedrooms of the seminarians, you know, one of them's got, you know, pictures of pinup models on his, uh, on his wall. <laughs> and uh, I distinctly remember him saying, you know, I'm going to make a serious effort on chastity next year. This is, he's, say, ah. he's saying this, uh, he's saying this, out loud to the whole country, and I'm thinking, well, that just does not make any sense. I mean, if if you clearly we're all human, so we can all be tempted, whoever we are. But you don't put a poster up. <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's uh, that's almost like living in sin. It's like what well, is objectively sinful. you're making a yeah. decision that you know. Okay, you're not making a decision saying, okay, well, I've just been tempted, but I'm gonna go to confession or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, every we're humans, we're sinners. That can happen. But this is, no, well, I'm actually going to go down to wherever I'm going to buy a poster. I'm going to put this up. So the first thing I see when I'm waking in the morning is uh, is this. So I'm thinking, well, how could you? How could you go to a seminary like that and then try to live as a priest? Unless you've got a completely different version of what a priest is. Right. And uh, I was not interested in any way in becoming, uh, you know, just another social worker. Mm -hmm. If I want to be a social worker, I can go and be a social worker. And then I can also get married. Yeah. Um, so I think that's what sort of ruled out the possibility of going to a Novus Ordo seminary is that you can't, the reason I went to the Society of St. Pius X, <clears throat> I suppose it's really because I did not, uh, I did not even consider any other possibility. Um, the Fraternity of St. Peter and the Institute of Christ the King did not at that time exist at all in Ireland. And also I suppose it was the, the intuition that, the position of the Society of St. Pius X was the correct one. And you, so you mean that regarding to the crisis? Yeah. Yeah. Well, regarding the crisis. Exactly. Yeah. So, well, you know, and this is something that I think more and more people are starting to realize. And we should say, um, uh, there has been healthy disagreement amongst Catholics for a long time. And people need to understand that that's fine. Uh, the Dominicans and the Franciscans at each other's throats. I mean, almost, almost having like West Side Story brawls in the streets at some points back in, you know, the 12, 1300s and whatever. Um, insert the Jesuits, the problems with them and people. And this is the good Jesuits, not the ones now. Um, so for a long time, you know, there, there will be disagreements between this order or that order about how to deal with this or that. And there's nothing wrong with that. So if someone, for example, says, well, I believe the SSPX's position is... Uh, the most correct position for dealing with the uncertainty of the crisis, which is a position I, of course, agree with. It doesn't mean that they believe that someone who entered the seminary in a different order is somehow not trying to be a great and holy priest. Uh, we can disagree with policy and respect personnel, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, I think uh, Kennedy, the way I would explain it is that uh, God, <clears throat> our, our merciful God, sent our Lord Jesus Christ, his son, into the world in order to show us the path to heaven. And our Lord, God, respecting our free will, doesn't just say, okay, I'm going to force you all to go to heaven, so lose your free will. Okay, you're all going to become uh, just automatons. No, he uh, 
He came to freely give us salvation, and he also left the world at his ascension, but sent the apostles. As the Father hath sent me, I send you. That's the church. And the church is the pillar and ground of truth. And the the shepherds within the church are there to lead the sheep. We are the sheep. The shepherds are the pope and the bishops. And so, in general, uh, all you have to do is, in ge- I say in general, because of course there are exceptions, because the priest and the bishop and the pope, they also guard their free will. Yes. Uh, I, I always love the Chesterton uh, sort of quote. I don't know the exact quote, but it says, life is a story. It can go any way. Yeah. It's not because you have decided to get married that that's it. You're going to have a fairy tale life. Mm-hmm. You can actually decide tomorrow that you're going to be faithful or you're going to be unfaithful. Yeah. So the same thing with every human being, uh, with the Pope and the bishops. And so let's say you've got a good bishop. <clears throat> Excuse me. You've got a good bishop. Follow him. Easy. Yep. Yeah. But what do you do in the situation where the bishop or the Pope are actually being unfaithful to their job, mm-hmm. which is to feed the sheep, to teach the truth? Mm-hmm. That's And that's the essential one. The Peter is the rock, but the rock is the truth. Yep. As I was saying, St. Paul said, the church is the pillar and ground of truth. In mm-hmm. other words, if you lose the truth... Everything goes. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's where you are. So then you 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 you're in a sort of a, a crisis, and I would say that the crisis you mentioned this in your in your book, Kennedy, the crisis in the church is in fact a crisis of authority. It's it's not that there's stuff happening in the church. There's always been stuff happening in the church, and our Lord told us it was going to be like this. Yeah. He to, he didn't say you know this is going to be this magical uh, this magical kingdom where everything's going to be fine. It's going to continue being composed of the wheat and the cockle. Yeah. And at the end of time, we're going to make the separation. In other words, during that time, the uh, the good in the church will, will save their souls and the bad will either live to convert mm-hmm. or they will be there simply to try the good. Yeah. Okay. So the, 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 the authority is not really functioning. So the captain in the ship, you could say is, you know, he's asleep. Mm-hmm. It's like this, uh, Costa Concordia, I remember about 10 years ago, apparently the, they were passing along the coast of Italy and apparently the captain was sort of carousing up in the bridge and completely ignoring what was happening and they were in the ground. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, that's going to happen if, if the captain's not either delegating his job correctly or doing it properly. So uh, I hope I don't get you into trouble with that and perhaps that's never that's been fine. proven. <laughs> so anyway, the, the thing is, what are you going to do? So a number of people are going to say, well, you know, we're just going to abandon the Catholic Church because this just shows that, you know, it's not really it's not really important, not really necessary. But then there's a, a whole group of Catholics who are going to say, well, we need to continue, we need to keep the faith. And these people, because they don't have the correct guidance, they're going to react according to their temperaments and preferences, really. So you're going to have people, for example, who... I would call it, you know, the, the set of Acantus mentality, mm-hmm. okay? Set of Acantus mentality is, well, you know, we know that uh, the Pope is the Pope. You know, how can the Pope do this? Yep. He's not the Pope, mm-hmm. okay? So it's sort of like running, jumping to conclusions. It's sort of saying, you know, uh, that that's not acceptable to me. Well, yeah, but, I mean, you are not the person who has the authority within the church to say that the Pope is not the Pope. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. so then other people are going to say, well, uh, you know, we need to hold on to our parish. We need to stay in there. We need to be obedient, etc. People are reacting according to their, let's say, their temperaments mm-hmm. and, and their characters, let's say, their, their upbringing. And um, <clears throat> I think God's going to be very merciful on everybody who is trying to do his best. And God's going to be very merciful on, you think of all those Catholic kids growing up today who've never received anything. Yep. God's going to be very merciful to them because they've never received anything. Yeah. Well, Jesus says, forgive them for they, for they know not what they do to the people who are killing them. Exactly. So yeah. um, obviously we know there's an objective moral law and we understand that conscience must be rightly understood in the traditional sense, but we also understand that there's a subjective nature to each person and only God can know the heart. Mm. And the, the problem in the modern church though, is that that becomes the whole of the law. Whereas, yes. yeah. you know, it's like, it's like, um, you know, we've already annoyed the state of a contest. We can annoy the Fenites. Um, <laughs> um, obviously baptism is necessary for salvation. Yeah. We are bound by the sacraments. Obviously we don't take that to mean the exception means the rule, 
But if there is someone who dies by baptism of desire, they're martyred for the name of Christ and so on and so forth, God's in charge of that. We're not in charge of that. He reads the heart. He reads the soul. Um, so in our age, you know, there are plenty of people who are sticking it out in the Novus Ordo. So when we left the Novus Ordo, um, it was like taking the red pill, you know, that expression. You know, I started seeing things and I'm like, I never saw it while I was there. I think that's a big part of it too, is until someone is forced out or there's something happens where they have a situation where they can go to a traditional mass for, let's say two or three months and they kind of get recalibrated, then they start to see things and the old things seem sour. But while you're in it, you're so used to it, they don't. Um, so when I left, I realized I can't ever look back. But when I was in it, I did not have that intuition at all. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So I can't look at someone who's there and say, well, how can they sit there and how can they put up with, you know, the uh, altar girls or whatever? And it's like, mm -hmm. well, they're not really putting up with it. They just don't really know what to do about it. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're you know, trusting their yeah. pastors. And uh, as always, every crisis in the church comes from the clergy. Yeah. It's not the people. Yeah. Arius was not a layman. Yeah. Is he a deacon? <laughs> he was a deacon. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's none of these heretics. That's an argument against religion. permanent deacons, by the way. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh, it's it's like, uh, I think it was Benedict XVI. Somebody said, you know, you don't think we should have a more fraternal church? And yeah. he said, what, like Cain and Abel? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, That's true. Um, yeah. So I think the thing to understand is that is that God God alone can and does judge the heart. And okay. none of us have even to make an attempt to judge the heart. Yeah. Um, however, you and I have to say, well, okay, what's the most correct position in a crisis? Yeah. You know, if the ship's going down, you can't just say, you know, well, everybody just do the first thing that comes into your mind. No, you say, Let, let's follow the rules of the drill we did. You know, mm -hmm. we have, there, there are some things you should do. And we do know what the rules for a crisis are. And they are, first of all, hold fast to what was believed everywhere by everybody. Right. Okay. So, because in a crisis, it seems like everything's shifting. Yes. You know, everything's moving. The ground's moving. Oh, my goodness. Does that really mean then that the lottery is okay now? Yes. Because Father so-and-so is saying that, oh, yeah, that's that's not a sin. You know, God would want to give you a second chance. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, you think, oh, my goodness, does that... Because you do actually feel, you know, oh my goodness, is is, is this true? Mm -hmm. Because the thing about humans is that we we go along or we're, we tend to go along or we're very urged to go along with what everybody's doing, what the culture is right now. Mm -hmm. And if the culture right now is good and everything's true, that's good. But you need to keep using your 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 reason so that you're not just going along with it because you're going along, but you're doing it because it's the truth. Yeah. And so in a crisis, you say, well, what are we going to do? What's the correct position? And that's why I firmly believe, and as you say, you know, there are good people who are not going to agree with me, but I do firmly believe that Archbishop Lefebvre was, you know, chosen by God for this role. I do too. Yeah. I believe that. And it's a story. He it could have gone either way. Mm -hmm. He could have said, look at, you know, and we would have, we would not have judged him harshly. He could have said, "Look, at, I'm up to here with it. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm not, go I'm not going to. I'm just going to keep keep a low profile." Yeah. But he didn't. He didn't. He said, uh, "I need to do something. I need to faithfully transmit what I received, and I need to do something with the grace of my episcopate." You know, you know when Archbishop Lefebvre is finally canonized <clears throat> one day, it will happen. It, it will, will happen. Yeah. Well, and he'll be the first saint in a hundred years that had a devil's advocate. <laughs> because yeah. uh, I don't know if there's been any man, you know, again, the book that I wrote, why did I write the book? Well, because um, for some reason, um, people treat the, the the question of this SPX as if it's this continually unanswerable enigma, the greatest <laughs> mystery of mankind. And it's like, it, it it's just so, it's so silly. Like, you know, you can, the, the Rome says... Rome says, objectively speaking, you can attend mass there. Rome says they have faculties. And it's like, but here's how they're still in schism. Right. It's like, this is stupid. You can't be in schism and have faculties. That's but, right. You know, and again, there is an argument to be made, well, we don't need the positive law necessarily to say something because in a crisis, you obviously can't trust all the institutions. Okay. Fine. When it's the institutions that are causing the crisis. That's right. Yeah. But the point is for the critics, the institutions that you're looking to to say they're in schism aren't saying it. Mm -hmm. So there's no basis for your perspective mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so I wrote the book because I said, 
um, you know, it, 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 back to this idea of being judged mercifully and, and looking at the situation, it can't possibly be that Catholics in our day must listen to, well, they should listen to my podcast, but it can't be that they, they must listen to endless debates about canonical statuses of priests with faculties because someone on a podcast decides that they have a, a reason to criticize. It, this, this, there's no way this can be a matter of salvation. This is absurd. I mean, people are spending, uh, even Eric Ibarra, who's a scholar I really, really enjoy, um, and he writes a lot about the Eastern Orthodox, and he's firmly, the Eastern Orthodox are not correct in this opinion or that. Yeah. But his years and years of study, he said, I'm looking at these babushkas and their veils, lighting the candles, the theotokos and stuff. And he says, this stuff is so complicated. I'm not going to make any comment on the individual person because I don't know what's going to happen. How could I know? I mean, someone's going to get a theology exam on this issue that there's a thousand years of polemics back and forth against each other. But this is absurd. So when it comes to the Society of St. Pius X, and this is, I'm not relativizing the situation. I'm just talking about the individuals. Um, with the SSPX, people act as if, um, you know, you've got to consume 1500 pages of someone's theological dissertation before you can know you're in schism or not when you attend mass. This is absurd. Yeah. Yeah. This is, it's not Catholic. Thomas Aquinas was very clear. You'll know the truth simply, mm -hmm. you know, you'll see something like even, even the, you know, an argument for the, for the immaculate conception. Well, it's fitting. It's fitting that Christ yeah, would, I mean, right. it's yeah. very simple. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, we can get into deeper things, fine. But the average Catholic can look at an icon and can understand Catholicism. Mm -hmm. A Catholic can under, listen to a sermon and understand Catholicism. Um, and, and in this crisis, it's very simple. You don't know where to take your children to Mass. You don't know, uh, like, your son wants to be a priest and there's a homosexual problem at many of the seminaries in this diocese it's been known for years um you know it cannot possibly be the case that well my son does want to get souls to go to heaven so he's just going to have to tough out the homosexual seminary it's like no he's not yeah. no he doesn't have to do that yeah. that seminary over there there's some debate about it but the priests are, are are real priests and they have real sacraments it's very simple yeah yeah and i think you you're you're quite right Kennedy. that uh, it's it's the same thing it's the sort of Ob objective in reality. Yes. This is the situation. And then there's also uh, God's reading of people's hearts. So in other words, in let's say if you take the Orthodox, for example, yeah. uh, it's not up for you or me to say, did that Orthodox woman save her soul? Yeah. Because God sees, well, actually she's in invincible ignorance, it's called. It's, yeah. How could she have known yeah. that she was actually in schism? Because it's been pumped into her head from, you know, the very beginning that you know the pope is not yeah. the head of the church and so she she accepts that it's yeah. the definition of invincible ignorance is that having made all the uh, effort that was you know uh, that you knew you had to mm -hmm. that was evident to you that you had to you couldn't find this out that's right okay so uh, actually um, <clears throat> blessed uh, john sullivan uh, interesting character he was the um, he was the son of the Lord uh, Lieutenant of Ireland, okay. <clears throat> Protestant, became a Jesuit, mm -hmm. and so he was he was converted from Protestantism, and he he said, you know, when Protestants die, don't assume that they're going to hell, mm -hmm. because obviously they're baptized, mm -hmm. um, although not all Protestant baptisms are valid. That's but, right. Uh, you may you may have uh, the also sprinkling thing there. isn't valid or whatever, right? <clears throat> There's weird yeah. things go on, even in Catholic churches now, yes. weird things go on. We baptize was one of those <clears throat> scandals that, that the, the we baptize instead of I baptize was a problem. And also, uh, well, hold on a second now. You say the words, I'll pour the water. Yes. That's another one okay. that's uh, not valid. Um, so yeah, he's, he's saying, look, at that, that's God's mystery because you, yeah. you think of, of somebody who's, you know, the Protestants, more or less, I remember meeting a guy actually not far from here. I was at a, an old folks home and he was in a wheelchair. He had just sort of drifted down the, the long lane, and I, I wheeled him back up. And and he said, uh, you know, you a Catholic? And I said, yeah. I said, don't like Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, you're welcome. <laughs> so in other words, yeah, he wasn't against me. No. It was just that he's been uh, brought up to think that, you know, Catholics are, you know, they adore statues, and they are really pagans, and that the uh, Pope is in fact the war of Babylon, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So God works all that out, what yeah. was possible, what was not possible. But objectively, the Protestant claims against the Catholic Church are, are rubbish. Yeah. They're rubbish. Yeah. They're, not, yeah, they're false and they're stupid. Yeah, but yeah. exactly. Yeah. So uh, it's uh, they're, uh, uh, 
the the fact then is that uh, you could say that somebody like a Protestant bishop, yes, like a Protestant Much bishop, more you know, he should uh, yeah. he should really know because he he knows the history. Yeah, he knows how this started. Yeah. Um, but anyway, God will judge, and uh, we we do not have to judge people's hearts. What we do have to do judge is we have to judge the situation. We have to judge That's what right. does God expect of me now. I was talking to somebody yesterday talking about sort of similar issues. And I said, you know, you can't, for example, just, you know, send your child to this uh, completely corrupt school and then say, well, you know, God can save his soul anyway. Yeah. No, that that is, you cannot do that because you have to say, well, in these circumstances, God is expecting me to act prudently and mm-hmm. with uh, wisdom, putting my best foot forward um, having considered all the things, having prayed to say, what do you want me to do, Lord? And then whatever I decide, in a sense, that's the right thing to do. Because once I've made a prudent decision, I'm not sure what the outcome is going to be. Okay, you know what I mean? Is mm-hmm. when, you, when you got married, for example, and I know that uh, Brittany is uh, the love of your life. She is. But it could have turned out completely differently. Yeah. You know what I mean? You made a prudent decision. Mm-hmm. But there are people who have done the same thing, and then a few years down the road it's turned out that this person is not the person I married. Yeah. So what have you made a bad decision then? Yeah. No, you did not make right. a bad decision. You made the right decision. Same thing with priests who sort of, you know, after if 10 years, they say, yeah, I was never meant to be a priest. No, that's not true. Yeah. That's You're having not a rough true. patch, but you made yeah. the decision. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Your life is a story. So, uh, you know, that's uh, you, you went down maybe a wrong path, whatever it might be, but now... Now you're there. You can work it out. Yeah. You can work it out with God's help. Yeah. You can always do something. Yeah. <laughs> so the thing there with the, the Society of St. Pius X is that when you look at, I mean, I know we, we probably don't have time to go into the whole thing, but if you made a plug for your uh, your book, I can make a plug for the video called Why the SSPX is Correct yes. on the SSPX YouTube I'll link channel. That in, I'll link that in the show notes. It's, uh, you know, it's a bit of a long video, but you, you can skip over it. But the, the important thing to take out of it, I think, is that Archbishop Lefebvre acted in a crisis because in a crisis not all of the man-made rules apply that's right so in a in in a crisis for example um i gave the example of uh, in our town 80 years ago this um orphanage went on fire again take this with a pinch of salt because a lot of the things you hear about what you know catholics did may not be true but the story was that the nuns who were running the orphanage would not let the fire brigade in because the children were dressed in their nightgowns and of course no man is allowed into a place where nuns are sleeping Mm -hmm. and so they followed this uh, man-made rule which is a good rule it's a good rule men should not be allowed into a cloister uh, um, etc but the thing is that in the crisis where there's a fire, that doesn't apply. Yes. So if they actually made that decision, which I honestly doubt, yeah. but if they did, yeah. and it's possible because humans are, we, we can get very confused. Yeah. Uh, if they did, that's a wrong decision. Yeah. Okay. Or if you're, uh, you know, you're trying to escape from uh, an axe murderer who's following you in his uh, yeah. Z720 and you're keeping the 50 kilometer an hour speed limit uh, as you go down the... Uh, the outskirts of the town, you don't have to do that. It's the classic example of your wife is in labor and you drive over the speed limit. I, you know, uh, if you got pulled over, the cop would most likely say, oh goodness, I'll guide you to the hospital now. Yep. We'll all go 110 kilometers an hour mm-hmm. because obviously that's what we're going to do. Or if he gave you a ticket, if you went to court, the judge would throw it out and probably give the the, the, the police officer a slap on the wrist for being such an idiot. Right. You know, um, the positive laws cannot apply when they don't serve their purpose. And this, okay. this is this is basic. We all understand this from COVID. We right. all understand this. Right. Um, I'm not in the habit of breaking the law, but when the government says you have to do something stupid and there's con- and, and I know there'll be consequences I'm in the habit of do- I'm in the habit of not doing that if I can avoid it you know mask mandates and things like that at the same time if somebody decides to follow the 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 rule even though it's not necessarily meeting the muster as far as just laws are concerned they're not sinning by doing so because they're not doing something intrinsically immoral to do it right yeah and that that's important because St Thomas Aquinas explains this you know our our human laws always obliging you Mm -hmm. because this was one of the protestant fads right you remember that the catholics were accused of being disloyal to the king let's say in england because 
they were not keeping the law whereby you couldn't have anything to do with the Pope of Rome. Yep. Okay. So is that true? Do human laws always apply? So he explains, he says, well, there are a certain group of, of human laws that never apply. And those are ones that are not laws at all mm -hmm. because they actually forbid you from uh, doing something which is your duty or they command you to do something good. Yeah. Okay. So that would be the case if there was a human law, for example, that you can't breathe unless you, uh, you offset your carbon emissions. Yeah. That's not a law. Yeah. Or there's a law that says, yeah, yeah, you can have a, you can have uh, euthanasia. You know, it's a very sad situation in Canada, mm -hmm. in Quebec particularly. I think eight percent of deaths are now murder. Yeah. It's uh, medical assistance. I believe that will continue to rise. Too. It will absolutely, yeah. yeah, because it's it's a descent into despair. In fact, that's right. It's the the suicide is the one sin where you say, you know what, the entire world is not worth it. Well, Chester, what did Chesterton say yeah. about suicide? He said, um, when when a man murders a man, he kills one man. When a man commits suicide, he kills the whole world. That's right. Because he snuffs it, he snuffs it out of existence in his in, in his perspective. That's correct. Um, yeah. Obviously, people listening to this, depression is real. People have problems, but the gravity <clears throat> of the sin of suicide with full consent is obviously a very a big right. problem. Knowing that there are people who do commit suicide without full consent yes. because they're out of their minds, and, and we don't. And again, yeah. that's why we don't say anyone is you know in hell or heaven because we understand God. And that that's yeah. why, in fact, the the position of the church traditionally was that when somebody is known to have died in suicide, you cannot offer a public mass yes. for them. But you can offer mass. Yes. Why is that? It's because you have there has to be some sort of consequence. Yes. For because suicide is a sin that attacks the common good. That's right. There has to be a consequence. But if it's not even known, let's say it was it was occult. Yeah. Then you don't tell people, and you have the you have the whole mass yeah. the, with the black vestments and everything else. Yeah. So that's the the wisdom of the church. But I would just say on on getting back to the human laws. So those laws clearly do not apply. It's not okay. You cannot uh, comply with the law which tells you that you must offer medical assistance in dying in your care home. That's right. You can't. Okay. You you're going to lose your job. God will take care of you. Yeah. Now, there's another category of laws, and these laws, um, St. Thomas Aquinas tells us, is these laws are not valid per se because they either exceed the competence of the person who's giving the, the command, or they, um, they're, they in fact, against the whole goal of the law. And there's another third category. I, I didn't uh, revise this before I came, but I guess uh, people can check it up. Um, in any case, he says, well, these laws do not oblige per se, may, but they may oblige per accidents, by accident. Yeah. In other words, there may be something there that you need to take into account. In other words, you don't say, well, I have to obey this law. You say, well, what are the consequences of me not obeying the law or obeying the law? Classic example uh, would be our Lord Jesus Christ. So he was supposedly lawfully condemned to death mm -hmm. by Pontius Pilate. But in fact, it was unjust because he had done nothing uh, to yes, merit right. death. Yeah. But he chooses to comply. He didn't have to. He said, if I ask my father, he will send me 12 legions of angels. Yeah. Okay. There's the interesting part of the gospel earlier when our Lord preaches his first sermon. And uh, you remember that uh, the people brought him to the top of the hill to cast him down, mm -hmm. to try and kill him. And he... he he didn't go along with it. He yeah. passed through their midst. Yeah. In other words, he got away. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he had a choice. So why did he choose to comply? Because this uh, act of uh, obedience to his father's will, done freely and with love, at great cost to himself and with uh, no little fear of his of his human nature. This is the one thing which would save the world and all men mm -hmm. who chose would be saved by the power of the cross and by uniting themselves to our Lord and his, and his cross. So he chose to do so. Right. And so in a more mundane example, you could say, well, what do I need to, you need to take into account the common good. Yeah. Okay. Imagine Kennedy, I know you'd never do this, but maybe one day when you're a little bit frustrated, you may give an unreasonable order to one of your kids. Okay. This is entirely, no evidence of this entirely fictitious. Okay. Now, so, so let's say you, um, 
You know, you know how it is. You're tired. You're angry. Well, you're, 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 you're I'm taking that away for two weeks. It's like, no, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not yeah, taking yeah. your bike away for two weeks. Right. So, what yeah. does the kid do? Does the kid supposed to call up his canon lawyer and say, "Do I need to com- do I need to comply with this command?" Right. No, the kid needs to. Well, the common good requires more that dad retain his authority. Yeah. The kid's not going to think like this. Yeah. The kid's just going to feel hard done by, mm-hmm. and then you're going to make it up somehow later when you're when you've had your coffee or whatever Mm -hmm. so but yeah that that's the thing is you consider the common good it's it's more important to have the principle of authority that's why for example um saint alphonsus liguri you know he was he was kicked out of his post as Mm -hmm. the even out of the whole congregation which he had founded now if he was sort of in touch with the Black Lives Matter movement, he would have said, you know, I'm an oppressed minority, so black I'm ro- not black taking robes this. Matter. Black, yeah, robes, black matter. robes matter. Black robes matter, yeah. So I'm an indigenous, indigenous Italian, so uh, right. I need, uh, as you are in, 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 yeah. in uh, many ways. So anyway, no, he just complied. Mm. Why? Because it's more important for the, for the, and the example, the example of obedience which he gave, because he's not saying, how dare you? He's saying, God, whatever you want. Yeah. yeah. And so the thing there is that that's how to that's how to look at it and it's important as well and i want to underline this this is not saying that uh human laws don't matter this is not saying that oh yeah well you can just make up your mind on whatever command comes from the pope or whatever order comes from the king or whatever it might be no you do have to obey that is a virtue you do have to obey but because human beings are limited and no human legislator can possibly consider all of the circumstances where his law is going to apply, then there are going to be circumstances where you're going to have to uh, use your reason, the virtue of prudence, and say, actually, in this case, that law does not apply. And if that is done correctly, that is an act of virtue. Yes. The idea of the Protestant thing, because as... Virtue you know, of nome? <clears throat> the virtue virtue of, nome. Of, of nome, yes, yes yeah. So the, um, the Protestant sort of view... I know, I know both of us are, are lovers of Chesterton, so uh, yes. I think we can have a Chesterton fest today if we wish. We could. But as he says, it's not just the vices got out of control, the virtues got out of That's control. That's right. Puritanism. Yeah. yeah. So the virtues so the virtues are, are there, we're trying to do it, but not in the right way. Mm-hmm. So, for example, we have, we're going to be, let's say, uh, charitable, but instead of being charitable to, be, to persons, we start being charitable to ideas. That's right. No, it's the other way around. It's it's as uh, Gary Gou Lagrange put it. He said, "The church is intolerant in principle, yes, and tolerant in practice. Right. Whereas the world is tolerant in principle, but intolerant in practice." Well, I'm reading this book uh, by Marcel de Court right now. Okay, Father Franks, if you're watching this, thank you for giving me this. Um, I don't know if it's available online. I know these at the seminary, but it's called "Man Against Himself," and you talk about this idea of being. Um, uh, compassionate towards ideas rather than persons, so mm. to speak. Um, this is what happens when we have a dis- when the Catholic faith is rejected. We have a disordered um, we have a disordered epistemology and a disordered ontology. How we know and what we know and who we are becomes confused. Mm. This is why because Pro- Protestantism uh, ultimately always leads to something like a at least tacit denial of the incarnation because the sacramental reality of the faith is gone. Um, and it, and it becomes almost a Gnosticism because you, essentially as a Protestant, you're saved by knowledge. You're saved because you, right. you know of Christ. Well, okay, again, we don't know the individual, but um, that's not how we're saved as Catholics. I mean, there's a knowledge portion, but there's an actual sacramental incarnational reality where the person and nature, which are both governed by God, are they act within the sacramental economy where instruments of that nature in cooperation with God, act on our salvation. The, the, the Eucharist is a real thing. The, the water is a real thing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and when we reject that, we become sort of bifurcated and we go to two extremes. We go to the extremes of either animalistic nature. Right. He uses an amazing example in this book where um, um, he talks about how modern pornography usage is actually very similar to animalistic rape in antiquity because there are two extremes. The, my dog's barking, but um, in the past, a, bar- a barbarian would rape and pillage, and he dehumanizes the right. women. They're not human beings. Mm-hmm. He's just an animal. They're just animals. Okay. In our age, it's we're not even animals. We're just minds. We're just brains. Mm-hmm. So it's like a cerebral form of 
coercion and rape. It's as crazy as that sounds. There's a that this this is the when we're off off kilter, we're helter skelter. We go to these extremes of complete animal yeah. or non animal. Well, you know that's really sort of the essence of a heresy, isn't it? It's you pick on one thing. Chesterton right. says you choose your favorite Catholic dogma, you fix on that, and then you forget the rest. Yeah, and that that's really what it is. Is that Catholic means universal yes it's the whole truth yeah. and that's what nowadays people will call an ideology that's right an ideology is you just pick one thing mm -hmm. and then you forget the rest and same thing it's it's uh it's taking uh it's trying to impose something on reality that is not reality or or or, or forgetting a portion of reality yeah, exactly and yeah. this is why um one of the well, you see two trends now in society that show the natural, they show how people naturally understand what's wrong with the world, mm. They all, but they also submit to what's wrong. So um, on the one hand, there's the craze of AI, okay. which, okay. yeah, which really is, uh, and again, AI is a catch-all term, technically using uh, um, speech software where it goes to text is a type of ai mm -hmm. it's it just really means really fancy computing that's gps what it, is, is pretty, a type of ai excellent uh, use of ai <laughs> right so we wouldn't say never use ai because whatever that'd be like saying never use a calculator mm. i mean never I mean, it's a tool but but there is a transhumanist trend within people's desire for ai where they basically shut off their brains and the machine's going to do the thinking for them and the only reason people can even get to the point where they say it's artificial intelligence which it's not intelligence not at all even the fact that people accept that term it shows this is maybe getting into the weeds here but we've accepted this cartesian uh you know cogito ego sum we've they, i think therefore i am they've accepted this i'm a ghost in a machine mentality okay where your existence is only known through your consciousness and so on and so forth um and that's why they but on the other hand we see another trend in society where more and more people are concerned with environmentalism, uh, but they're not concerned with the actual environment as a being a, a, a creature within the creation. Mm -hmm. They're concerned with nature as a platonic form. Okay, yeah. You see yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? It's, and uh, this is the I'm imbalance. interested in humanity, but not you particularly. Yes. Yeah. Not a human. Okay, so we got off topic there. We stopped for coffee. You were talking about St. Alphonsus and the positive law. Yeah, so St. Alphonsus was... Uh, removed from his congregation, he accepted, he obeyed. And that is, in fact, the correct thing to do. Mm -hmm. So if the Pope tells you to do something, it's not against the faith, um, then you you should do it because you're going to do greater good by your obedience, even though technically you're not obliged to obey when somebody exceeds their command, but you will do greater good by doing that. However, this does not excuse you from actually having human and rational supernatural obedience. In other words, right. you can't just say, well, whatever the Pope tells me to do, I'm going to do it. You have to say whatever the Pope tells me to do, and he has lawful authority to do so, and such is God's will, I will do it. Because ultimately the purpose of obedience, like all the virtues, like all the acts of our lives, is to seek God, to unite ourselves with God. And that's why in fact, uh, monks and nuns take a vow of obedience, and people sometimes misinterpret this because they think, "Oh my goodness, how can you just do? You know, you're you're sixty. Whatever you're told, yeah. yeah. How can you? You're, you know, you're sixty. Why why are you just doing whatever you're told? And you need to go and ask permission for this and permission for that. And the answer is, well, I chose freely to do this yes. because by doing so, I am uniting myself with God because each act of obedience shows me this is God's will. So it's it's kind of like a a game in a sense, you know. I uh, I was completely free. Mm -hmm. I was not compelled because if you're compelled to take vows, they're not valid. Just yeah. like if you're compelled to marry, it's not valid. Right. Um, I chose to be obedient, following the evangelical council of obedience, Matthew chapter nineteen, mm -hmm. and this is these are the terms of the of the rule. It's it's I know that when I obey my superior, I'm doing God's will. And that becomes an act of religion because it's a vow. That's right. And so this is what I chose. And it's I'm doing it completely freely. <laughs> and if my superior tells me to do something which is against God's law, I'm not going to do it. Great example of that. I know we're going way up topic again, but I'm going to get to my point in a second. Uh, St. Bernadette. 
So Saint Bernadette. Saint Bernadette Subaru. Subaru, yeah. yeah. So uh, not not Subaru as the car, but uh, Subaru. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. She was uh, in the Basque down the ba- Pyrenees in the Basque country. That's where Lourdes is, I think, isn't it? Anyway, so she is a nun, and her reverend mother tells her uh, sister, "You're too sick." You're not. You're not to go to mass. Okay. Sometimes you need to tell people that mm-hmm. you need to say, "Look, you're not going to mass." So that's fine. She doesn't go to mass. Sunday comes around. She goes to mass. Reverend Mother is very upset. You disobeyed me, and sis, Sister Bernadette replies, "No, I didn't. You didn't have the authority to stop me from going to mass on Sundays because it's that's the law of the church. It's that's the law of the church." Yeah. Now, what does that show? It shows that yeah, your obedience is it's it's rational because blind obedience can be understood in a good way and in a bad way. Yes. So understood in a bad way, blind obedience means I don't even think. Yes. Okay, I'm just I'm just uh, an unthinking machine that does whatever I'm told. Blind obedience in a good way means once I think and know that this is not something which is against God's will mm-hmm. and the circumstances are not completely crazy, then I don't care what it is, I'm going to do it. Right. And that's really the real virtue of obedience. Getting to Archbishop Lefebvre, so a similar thing happened to him. He was told by the local bishop and ultimately by it was the pope's will and i know that michael davies went into the technicalities of this and i said yeah whatever but really he should have obeyed shouldn't he yeah and the answer is well yes except that in those circumstances it was the one circumstance where he shouldn't Mm -hmm. because if he had shut down his seminary then that was the end of the traditional mass it was was it was and people need to understand this is 1974, 1975. Um, the Latin Mass was never technically abrogated, but it was abrogated. Mm. Mm-hmm. It was de facto canceled, even if it wasn't de jure canceled. Right. And, there, and everybody was saying, you can't do this. Everyone was saying, you can't do this. And there was one bishop. Well, there was Bishop Castro Meyer, but he was in a diocese. Uh, and there was no mechanism for him to send his priests other places. So... Uh, I know that the bishop of Cam- the diocese of Campos and the SSPX aren't on the same terms they used to be necessarily, mm-hmm. but uh, even even for the great work that Bishop Castro Mayer did, it was an insular solution. It was a solution for a diocese, which is great. God be praised, as well as there were priests like Father Norman did in Canada, mm-hmm. and there were men who were holding out. But Archbishop Lefebvre was uniquely in a position from his formation, uh, having been a missionary. Also, the fact that he was retired, right, and had an order mm-hmm. that was very interesting. Um, because, for example, like one of the good bishops we have right now is Bishop uh, Strickland. He, he's doing really great things, um, and but there's been an ap- apostolic visitation of him, which is to do with run of the mill things on paper, but obviously it's because he's orthodox and talks about it in public, and um, so people are saying, well, if Bishop Strickland gets kicked out. He needs to pull a Lefebvre or something like that. He's actually not in a position to do that. Mm-hmm. That's the interesting thing is Lefebvre already had the association of, he already had the the the, the order of the association of priests, the, yep. the society. So it wasn't as if, well, now I'm kicked out. Now I'm going to go do something I have no permission to do. It's I'm going to continue doing the thing I had the rightful permission to do yep. and not stop when the wrongful order comes down. It's a very important distinction. Absolutely. Yeah. And it was the correct thing to do in the circumstances. I'm not saying that I would have had the courage yeah. to do it because the the Catholic instinct is you you obey. And it's, yeah. it's a very wholesome instinct. But there are times when you do not obey the Pope. Uh, if the Pope tells me to do something which is a sin, I must say no. Why? Because you cannot give me a command which is against God's law. The po- any uh, obedience to a human authority is always going to be limited because all obedience is in fact to God, yes. which is a good thing. To, I found uh, when I was a school teacher to remind teenage boys because they sometimes think that you know because they're being told what to do that somehow it's being it's demeaning towards them. But I found that once you remind them that look, you're not obeying me. It's just I happen to be the depository of the authority in this circumstances. And uh, you're obeying God. That, that's what it is. Yeah. And God makes known his will to us. One of the channels is through humans, mm-hmm. oh, through circumstances as well, but through obedience. So in this circumstance, so Archbishop Lefebvre had founded the Society of St. Pius X. He hadn't had any premeditated plans to do so. He was kind of compelled by these uh, seminarians who were in trouble. 
uh, you can reference that that documentary I was talking about a little earlier. I don't think it was quite that bad, but uh, well, it the, got there. At the French seminary, they flew a communist flag from they the did. balcony. That's pretty bad. That is pretty bad, yes. In, in a sense, that's worse because that's a, a manifestation of a... Of a, it's an anti-Catholic uh, ideology yeah. versus a guy who's a bit sinful, which joined yeah. a club, right? Yeah, mm. it's it's a, it's a it's a sin against the there faith you go. per se. There oh, you yeah. go. Yeah. So anyway, so he had set up the service of Pius the tenth. He had had lawful permission to do so, and he was shut down effectively because he's saying the traditional mass. You need to get on board. Yeah. New, say the new mass and accept uh, the new direction. And the new direction, it's not just like. Well, he doesn't want to accept something new. It's that, well, it depends what the new thing is. Mm -hmm. So if the new direction is, well, we're just going to sort of fillet the church of what is really Catholic so we make it more acceptable to those who are not Catholic, and by doing so actually attempt to kill the faith mm -hmm. within Catholics, then he said, I'm not on for that. Yeah. And so in that circumstances, he saw that this was the case where the human law is not to be obeyed. Yeah. And that's an act of virtue. It is. And I was just reading um, my Bible. Is, my Bible's over there. I read it in the morning. Um, and uh, Acts chapter 16. No. Oh. Chapter 16? I don't know. how. Whatever. It's in Acts. Obey God over man. Whatever. Right. Yeah. And that I read, literally read that passage this morning <laughs> when Peter is uh, at the temple and they say, I'm the high priest. And yep. he says, you are the high priest, but I must obey God over man. Mm -hmm. Meaning the God has infallibly shown this to us and yep. I must follow it. And, and it's very rare. Yeah. So, but, but that, but what that not, what that is not yeah. is me saying, you know, I've got my own conscience. Right. I can do whatever the heck I want. And my conscience tells me, no, that's not what that is. Yeah. You're, this is your the conscience they're talking about is just like a feeling. Yes. What we're talking about in Artur Lefebvre is actually analyzing the circumstances and saying, it's not about me. If it's just about me, I'm happy to to lay down my sword and to, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, go into exile. It's not about me. This is actually about the continuation the faith. of the faith and yeah. the traditional mass. And that's the one thing. Um, Archbishop Lefebvre, uh, you know, when you read what he has to say, it's very simple. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's very simple, it's very straightforward, and it's it's absolutely correct. Yes. It's the faith. And I think people sometimes say, well, yeah, but God could have, you know, done it some other way. Absolutely, God could have done it some other way. Lots that, of things but are possible. In those yeah. circumstances, in his shoes, yeah. you don't want to be the guy who's saying, I'm sending my kid to the bad school because yes, right. God can save her soul. Exactly. And he, you can't do that. Yeah. You can't do that. Man has to take responsibility. God has given us free will, and he actually he's actually given you free will. There will be consequences to what you do or you don't do. Yeah. Well, this, you know, there's two two things here that's remind me of. For one, people say, well, uh, you know, well, there's another tangent I won't fully go on, but Catholics really need to do some investigation on what conscience actually means. Mm. I think that we've been inundated with this Protestant error of what conscience is. Yes, yes. And then they think that basically conscience only means doing what's objectively ordered for you to do. It's like they can't see the nuance of, no, you can't be Martin Luther and say, God's speaking to me, I'm changing religion. <laughs> yes. But you also can say, I know my faith, mm -hmm. and I know that that bishop has an office, Yeah. but I do also know that what he's asking or encouraging or implying, because remember, Pope Honorius was never technically a heretic, but he was anathematized after for not stopping heresy. Right. So there's a, the church shows us that um, it's a grave scandal. It's a grave sin against the faithful, or whatever you want to call it, uh, when a bishop fails in his duty. And mm -hmm. how do we know he fails in his duty? Because we have the faith and we know the faith. So my conscience is not saying I'm the bishop, but my conscience is saying, I do know what the bishop is doing is going to hurt my children's faith. And I... I must get them to heaven Yes, more than I must do what I know he's asking me to do is wrong. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And this is is very important because what we're talking about is a, is a comparison to what was always believed everywhere by everyone. That's right. This is not a comparison to, and with all respects to you and your confreres, Kennedy, yeah. some guy I saw on YouTube. Most of them are not very smart. <laughs> You're the exception. I, of course. I'm among them. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, and that's a mistake we can make because sometimes we go, well, yes. I heard about this person who had a vision last week over in Zurich. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, this person says that in a couple of months, this is going to happen. Or if you stop the video here, well, do you see what uh, Pope Benedict's actually doing with his hands at this moment? Yes. And therefore, I know that I shouldn't do what the bishop says. Mm -hmm. no, not, not at all. 
This is what you're absolutely certain of. And what we're absolutely certain of is what has been passed down to us. What is the faith? And what yes. you're not certain of, you say, well, look at, uh, you know, I, I can't make a decision on that, but I don't have to. Because as you pointed out re- earlier, you don't have to have a PhD in theology and watch a million hours of videos to PhD, be able to practice PhD, faith. A PhD today might be a detriment considering <laughs> the state of most universities. Uh, you're right. Yeah, I, 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 uh, you can rest your case now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, no, you're right, and that's one of the reasons why I appreciate Bishop Schneider so much, um, Bishop Bathanasia Schneider, because he's spoken about three days of darkness, uh, which gets me in trouble with the trads. But it is not a teaching of the church. I understand there are many, there are a few mystical visions kind of cobbled together, yeah. and it becomes a theory. It is not a teaching of the Catholic Church. Uh, the church is not an article of faith that one must have a basement no. full of beeswax candles. Right. If you'd like to do that, that you can do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we can, traditionalists, Medjugorje types, charismatic types, everyone who's got zeal yeah. can, there, you know, the zeal of your house can consume you, so to speak. Mm-hmm. You know, you can fall off into rabbit holes and traditionalists are not immune to that. Uh, one of the things I like to remind my fellow traditionalists is about, we're right about doctrine, we're not right about everything else. Right. And that leads me, if I may, can we move on to this okay. difficult nope, absolutely. question? Okay. Yeah, please. Because we're talking about obedience. We're talking about um, uh, the, the, you know, keeping the faith, the rightful, rightful order of, of authority and so forth. We did have this controversy. I don't know if people know there was this thing called COVID. Um, it's, I'm sorry? It's, it's, well, it's traditionally called communism, um, but they called it COVID this time. They spelled it with a V. And uh, there was a, a vaccine. And YouTube says that we can talk about vaccines now as long as we don't talk about whether or not we will make an objective claim about the goodness or badness of the vaccine necessarily in like okay. the scientific sense. But we can talk about the morality of it. So don't worry, we won't get taken down. Now, I am in accord with the, and I should prepare for, I should um, distinguish what I'm saying here. When I say the Society of St. Pius X's position, it's not really true that the SSPX per se, has a position that's promulgated that's binding on all priests or people that right. attend Mass. Yeah. Because the SSPX is not an organ of the magisterium in the technical sense. No. And never pretends to be. But, of course, given the nature of the crisis, uh, the SSPX understands that many people look to their priests, rightfully so, for guidance because they can't always go to the normal channels. So in this situation, with the rolling out of the vaccine that people were concerned about or happy about, depending on where they stood... The SSPX took a position, which I believe is technically just the Catholic position, where um, the rules about medication usage in general, whether it's abortion tainted or not, is, is there a grave reason? Uh, Are there other options? Um, Is it intrinsically sinful to in this situation or not? And these are basically the guidelines. So essentially the SSPX, many traditionalists said they were soft on the vaccine. Right. I don't believe that because one thing I will... uh, offer some uh, insight to my fellow American traditionalists. There is a world outside of the United States of America and in other countries, I know it's hard to believe there are other countries in the world that have different cultures. Uh, There is no such thing as personal freedom in the sense as understood the United States in most other countries in the world, the way they understand it. I had a friend in Italy, he's a Catholic there and he didn't get vaccinated. He wasn't even allowed to go into the post office. Uh, he was very despairing. He wasn't sure what was going to happen to him. Uh, there were people who, you know, even here in Canada, it was pretty bad. You know, I was talking to some of our priests and they were thinking, will we have to draw straws and have the hospital priest? Yep. No, that, that, very, was, that was a real conversation. A real sure. conversation. Yeah, yeah. There are Catholics in uh, Cuba. I know the SSPX has served there in the past. Um, should they leave the Catholics there without sacraments? Because yep. there's a, you know, so all these things come into play. And the SSPX basically said, um, make your own decision. Here's the church's teaching. So was the SSPX soft on the vaccine or were people perhaps maybe a little uh, overzealous due to the confused nature of the times? Uh, this is a really good question. And um, I, I just... Quick, quick anecdote sure. before I get into it. I'm going to not trying to change the topic, but I remember at the beginning, very beginning of COVID, you know, we didn't really know what was going on. Yeah. Uh, there was, there was a fog. It's uh, a fog of war. And, yeah. yeah. And so we didn't know how deadly this might be, in fact. Right. 
Um, and I just remember that, uh, you know, the diocese had, had shut down one of my confreres, um, one of my confreres was called into the hospital and we were a little bit nervous because mm -hmm. we didn't know how bad this might be. So he said, okay, I'm, I'm going. And uh, off he went and came out and I said, that's it. This is the Catholic way. It uh, yeah. doesn't matter how, how serious this might be. The priest has to go. Yeah. And, and in fairness, um, there were very few cases where a priest wasn't able to get into somebody in a hospital yes. because I know there were various regulations, but in the end, uh, there was always someone who said, look at, um, yeah. We'll let you in because some of the stories were almost miraculous. Almost miraculous. You know, walking yeah. in the back with the nurse after a cigarette break, and she sees him and doesn't say anything. Yeah. Like it was pretty cool. The I didn't hear about that one in particular, but um, I do know that Providence uh, is is watching over yeah. those who wish to. I mean, one particular case. I remember one of my confreres. He arranged with after much negotiation to get into someone who was dying. Mm -hmm. And next thing is, oh my goodness, there's one of the other ladies from the parish who's also dying over there, and we didn't know. Right. And she was able to also receive the the sacraments. Thank God both of the ladies did not die. Right. Uh, but they might have. Right. So yeah. But on the vaccine, so I think that the position of the SSPX on the vaccine, and I know that I will be in trouble with certain people for saying this, but I think it was absolutely correct. Yes. Now, I do not mean that everything said by every priest of the Society of St. Pius X was absolutely correct, yeah. because I know that priests had their own opinions. Yes. But let's say the uh, the guidance which was given by the, uh, you know, the, uh, the SSPX is not the Pope, not yeah. the bishops, but it, it's actually a fairly simple question, you know, can I receive this vaccine? And it was a real one. And so the, if I could re recapitulate the position of the SSPX, again, the position of of the Catholic Church, really. Using that term equivocally. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're using yeah. it, yeah. So is that, well, when you ask, may I do something, there are two things to consider. Is it lawful and is it prudent? Um, because lawfulness considers whether it's in accordance with God's law or in accordance with human law, for that matter. You know, is it lawful for me to drive above the speed limit? Well, bar those circumstances that you mentioned earlier, um, it's not lawful for me to, you know, exceed the speed limit um, unreasonably. Yes. It's just not lawful. So, no, I can't do that. Um, so, if but if you deem that it is lawful, mm -hmm. you know, is it prudent? So, for example, right. the speed limit could be on a particular road. It could be 100 kilometers per hour, but it may not be prudent to drive at 100 kilometers per hour. Because it's, it's winter, gravel road. It's winter, yeah. or you're having one of these downpours that we've had, yeah. hailstones you can't see. Yeah. Slow right down. Mm -hmm. It's not prudent. Yeah. So, if you say, well, I was obeying the law, mm -hmm. but you're not being prudent, then that's not an excuse. Right. Okay. So if you apply it to the vaccine, is it lawful? And the question on that really was um, the involvement of what I would call the grisly trade of body parts yes. from abortion, because in almost all the vaccines, I believe- There was some cooperation There was with some- yeah. uh, some element, let's say, of the vaccine, which was developed based on a body part, which had been... Or, or tested on it, even if it wasn't made with it. There right. Was a, yeah. right, there was some sort yeah. of level of cooperation. And so there, there, were, there was a school of thought which said, okay, well then, if that's the case, it, there has been a cooperation with the abortion uh, industry, then we can't have anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. And I think most Catholics were quite sympathetic to that idea. For Be good reasons. Yeah, yeah. because... It, it's a good instinct. It's I don't want anything to do with that, and so, um, and so that was that was seemingly a reasonable uh, point of view. However, that was not correct, and the reason it was not correct is because it's not the right principle. The correct principle is not to say um, I may not have anything to do with something which has something to do with evil. That is not the correct principle because if you do say that then it's going to lead you very far. Now, it's it's not that it's incorrect because it's going to lead you very far, but because it's clearly not the right principle. Yes. You know, I can't then go to most shops because most shops, for example, sell things which are, in fact, immoral. Yeah. So I go to a, I go to Shoppers Drug Mart. May I do that? Yeah. Well, they are. They sell the abortion pill. They sell contraception or whatever. But, you know. Now, 
it's going to depend on my level of cooperation as well. That's right. Right. So if I'm the, uh, you know, and you, this is not something that you have to make up, but something which is the consistent teaching of the moral theologians. St. Alphonsus gets another mention, uh, patron of moral theologians. Mm -hmm. um, it's It depends on your level. Of, it depends on a number of circumstances. And I'll just run through it very briefly because sure. I think it's important. Yeah. Uh, so cooperation with evil can either be a call, it's called technical term, it's called formal or material. Okay. Formal cooperation means that I cooperate with somebody who's doing a sin. Okay. And a sin is defined as an offense against God's law. It's not, uh, it's not something arbitrary. A sin is, St. Thomas Aquinas really explains this really well. He says, well, yeah, and a, sin, a sin is an offense against God's law, but we are, our actions are good when our actions are in accordance with our right reason guided by God, guided by the faith. And so whatever is not in accordance with right reason, guided by the faith, guided by God, is a sin. Mm -hmm. And that's a very important, it's a very clarifying yeah. way of looking at it because, again, the Protestant idea is that, you know, all of these sins, they're not really sinful. It's just God has decided that they're sinful. Yeah. No, it's not. It's, it's because by acting well, you're actually seeking the good. And a sin is when you miss the mark in some way. So... Uh, so a formal cooperation is where somebody's committing a sin. Let's imagine somebody's robbing a bank. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, some people say, well, is that a sin? Uh, yeah, that's a sin. Um, Darn. Even though the banks also rob you. Yeah, that's uh, right. <laughs> that's, that's also a sin. Um, so somebody's robbing a bank. And so I uh, formally cooperate either by agreeing with his goal yeah. and helping him because, yeah, I want to rob the bank. Yeah. That's a sin. Or I do something which is, let's say, intrinsically necessary for him to commit the sin. Mm -hmm. Okay? So in the case of, of robbing a bank, it would be, uh, for example, you know, I know the uh, key code, okay, of the, and of the vault. And you give it over. Uh, I'm an official at the bank. Mm -hmm. I either agree with him because he's given me 50-50. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's not much honor among thieves, but we'll see what happens. Yeah. Or, you know, I just don't have the backbone to say no. Right, and so I say, yeah, I know this is this is actually necessary for you, intrinsically necessary for you to uh, to get the money, and so you know, I'm afraid, you know, mafia, whatever it might be, and so I give you the code. Okay, that is called formal cooperation right. in evil. Or there's another one which is called uh, material cooperation. That's where you do cooperate, but not in a sense where you either uh, are seeking or agreeing with the goal of the action. Or that you're you're doing something without which the sin uh, could not be committed, okay? So this is the case, for example, uh, where let's if you take the the bank robber thing again. So uh, you are running a gun shop, mm -hmm. okay? So you sell guns, and uh, you sell the gun to the bank robber. But let's say you either didn't know that it was a bank robber, in which case obviously it's not your fault, or you did know. But you said to yourself, look, I need to sell, I need to make money. I need to sell these these guns. And uh, I do not agree with what, what he's maybe going to use this for. Um, but he's he's going to be able to get a gun somewhere else anyway. Right. In the circumstances, depending on the circumstances, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that you should necessarily sell it to him. But you can actually look at the circumstances because that would be accounted material cooperation. Right. Uh, you know, you're, you're selling drink to an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. Can you do that? Well, it depends. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're trying to make him drunk, then uh, you you want him to commit the sin. Then that would that would not be okay. Yeah. But uh, if you're you're just running a business and you know that some people are going to use this badly, mm -hmm. but you do not intend that, you do not cause it. So yeah. well, this this okay. So let's break this down even further regarding the vaccine, because again, I I and you know people don't need to share their personal medical information. I held out. I literally was writing for LifeSite News during this time. I was very critical of this vaccine and these things, and I did not agree with the paradigm and stuff. I did see uh, information on the um, on the right-wing side of things that I also was troubling because here's the problem, is on the left-wing side of things, there were these uh, predictions about how it was the greatest medicine ever invented and no yep. one's ever going to die again. Well, I followed the I fall I wrote articles following the hospital admission breakdowns data sets of who was admitted real time in the province of Ontario, and by the end of 2021, that just was not the case. It was just not even close to the case. I mean, there was a lot of issues with the information they were giving the mainstream public. But on the other side, uh, there were 
predictions about half the population of the world was going to die or whatever. And that yep. just has not yet happened. And okay, it could happen. Think Lots of things could happen, but we do start to sound kind of like, you know, the argument that communism has never been tried properly. You just have to do it harder. <laughs> I mean, there's always a possibility of something else happening. If it doesn't work out, it just let it go. It didn't, it didn't work, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but contemplating and, 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 and so I didn't get vaccinated and I, I don't support it. And I was, you know, I've had my rights taken away by the government and all these kinds of things. So I'm not, I'm not uh, bending the knee to that thing, but the morality is very clear. Um, let's take another example. This is a laptop computer that I'm, I have right in front of me and my phone is being used to film this. Those have precious metals or whatever they are, in, or not precious metals, uh, the minerals and things that are used for the batteries and whatnot. It's pretty clear that those are uh, cultivated in countries, at least in most cases or some cases, where what's that noise? There's like a goat outside. Um, you know, uh, they're cultivated in ways that are exploitative of workers, yep. and they work against the nature of the just wage and so forth. And the Bible is very clear: there are four sins that crowd to heaven, and one of them is basically not paying the worker his due. Yep. Uh, that God has made it clear: yes, murder is one of these things. Yes, sodomy is one of these things. Um. But one of them is if you defraud the worker of his wages. Yep. My computer is materially cooperative, probably, yes. in a sin that cries out to heaven. Mm -hmm. If we're just talking, because ultimately, if, if we're objecting to a vaccine or this or that or whatever thing, it can't be ideological. It must be because of the salvation of our souls. Mm -hmm. Do I think that I'm, I'm going to be damned because I use this computer? I don't think that. Even though I think that it is possible there is a sin that cries out to heaven that was involved in the chain of getting this computer to Canada. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Similar things must apply to the vaccines yep. or anything. Is abortion a damnable crime? Of course it is. But let's, let's use another example. Uh, you know, um, abortions in Ontario mainly take place in hospitals because it's quote unquote healthcare. Uh, if you work for the um, sanitation company that brings in the winter mats and the soaps and the things for the bathrooms and you're a faithful Catholic... Uh, and they ask you to, uh, you know, go put the load of toilet paper in the OBGYN ward or wherever where they do the abortions. Are you cooperating with abortion? Well, ultimately, they may use the towels or whatever you bring in as part of the procedure. Yep. So in a sense, yes, you are cooperating in the most remote sense possible. Mm -hmm. But it is impossible for you to be implicated in that. And you're not required to quit your job because one of your stops of the 40 places you deliver things to every day. You see where I'm going with this? Yeah, yeah. We can get into the realm of absurdity with this. Oh, yeah, for sure. So yeah. with this, it's, is there a grave reason? And maybe you can speak to this as well. We talked about obedience is wrong when it's exceeding the, or, or disobedience can be correct when the, Authority is exceeding its competence. Except it's not really disobedience. It, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's right. It's obedience to yeah. a higher principle. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we would say Archbishop Lefebvre did not disobey the Pope, but he obeyed the Pope, the papacy of all time or something like that. Yeah. Right. So when it comes to the science, though, listen, it's 2023. A lot is, mu a lot is much more clear about this now. Mm -hmm. It was not clear in 2021. Right. Right. And no one had the right to say that it was perfectly clear, although everyone did have the right to personally believe that it's clear for them, but you can't be judging somebody else for that. You have to make a prudent decision. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, I think that's, 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 that's correct. But how do you judge though? How do you judge? Can I cooperate? Cause this is material cooperation. Yes. Uh, in the case of, you know, somebody, let's say who's running a hotel and there's two people not married, you know, want to share a room, whatever. Can I cooperate? Mm -hmm. You have to, you have to ask the question. And the answer to that question is, if it's formal cooperation, then I must die rather than do it. Yes. Okay. So if it's a question of, yeah, I'm going to help you do the robbery, I can't do it. If it's a question of, yes, I am going to uh, provide you with the crucifix that you're going to make people tramp on, I can't do it. Yeah. Okay. Now, when it comes down to material cooperation, then you say, well, it depends. Okay. And this is, this is the question is that the... Again, we're really tapping on the Protestants today. Um, in a way, they deserve it. But uh, it's more like the Protestant heresiarchs. We're top, we're, it's not the, like the average Protestant who yeah. may be you know, trying his, his or her best, but it's really the ideas. So the, the idea there is, well, you know, the, essentially religion is not really rational. Yes. Essentially religion is not really rational. And this is all coming from the nominalism, 
and all the heresies which, uh, you know, people sometimes say, well, you know, uh, John Wycliffe and the Lollards, you know, they were, they were uh, pioneers of freedom. Look at what they actually thought and did. <laughs> okay. So uh, anyway, so they're, they're saying, well, religion is not really rational, but the, the, it is actually eminently rational. It's not just reasonable, it's completely rational because the, the reason is not in any way uh, sort of moved away from its sphere by faith. But faith, in fact, enhances mm -hmm. her reason. Anyway, the, the, the point is, okay, well, what are the rules? Well, it's quite simple. The Pro Protestants would apply the rule of the greater good or the lesser evil. So they say, well, it depends what the lesser evil is. Okay, so if the lesser evil is, um, you know, that everybody gets back to health or whatever by means of the vaccine, then it's okay to do whatever. Okay, that's not the correct principle. In fact, that's not a good principle because right. if a less so-called lesser evil uh, is in fact uh, intrinsically evil, then you can't do it. Okay, so uh, if you say, well, the woman's going to die, so I can kill the baby. And I know that's not really a case which happens, but let's say you say that, well, you can't kill the baby. Right. Because that is, it's not a lesser evil. A moral evil outweighs all possible physical evil. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, in the you apply the correct principle, which is the principle of the double effect. Yes. Okay. So the principle of the double effect. How does that run? Well, there's an act which has a good effect and a bad effect. That's the double effect. Mm -hmm. So an act which has a good effect and a bad effect would. This is a fairly good example, I think, and it's one which uh, <clears throat> we often use because it comes up a lot. It's it's a it's a, a woman who is sick and needs medical treatment. Mm -hmm. So she's yes. got cancer. And uh, she needs some medical treatment to treat the cancer, but she is expecting a baby. And she may lose the baby. She may lose the baby. Yeah. Okay. So is that permissible? And the answer is, it depends. Mm -hmm. You can't say, oh yeah, of course it's permissible because you need to save the mother. The fact is that it may not be permissible. We're going to have to see. You're going to have to apply four rules. Okay. The first rule is that the act you do in itself has to be good or at least indifferent. In other words, it can't be evil in itself. So what would be evil in itself in this case would be to kill the baby. Yes. Okay. So no, the act I'm going to do is I'm going to give radiation treatment. And radiation treatment is, I would say, indifferent. Right. It may be good. Yeah. If you have radiation treatment to treat your headache, that's not proportionate. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have to treat cancer, that is proportionate. Right. I mean, depending on the circumstances. Right. right. So that's the first rule. Mm -hmm. Second rule is that your intention has to be good. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in other words... Uh, our actions may be evil because they're evil in themselves, such as murder, or because my intention is evil. So evil is something which corrupts. Whatever is good is completely good under all possible consideration. And whatever is evil is good, but corrupted. Okay, so there's no such thing as completely evil. <laughs> so um, so that, in that circumstance, I could say, you know, I'm giving lots of money to these people, uh, uh, they're poor people. I'm giving them lots of money. That's a good action. Yeah. I'm intending to get them to convert to uh, Zoroastrianism. Okay. <laughs> well, that's okay. evil. Your intention is evil. Right. So the action is bad. Right. Okay. Even though you're giving money to the poor. Exactly. And that's very important to right. understand is that whatever is evil, whatever is good is completely good. And right. Whatever is e That's called the uh, principle of... Um, uh, I forget what, what the name of it is, but it's basically the principle of good is that whatever integral, is good... Integral, integral good. Integral, integral yeah, good, yeah. yeah. So it's whatever is good is integrally good. Yeah. And whatever is evil is partially good. Yeah. But corrupted. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's true of our actions. So any action which you do is not just 100% sinful. It's impossible. Okay, yeah. the, the closest you could get to that would be something that you know, really, you couldn't even describe. You know yeah. the bit in Macbeth where the, uh, I think it's Macbeth's asking the three witches that are, you know, doing their spell. He says, what are you doing? And they say, an act with no name. In other words, it's so evil, you yeah. don't even, you can't even describe it. Right. Whereas most actions are actually a mixture of good and evil. Right. And most sinful actions, in fact, all sinful actions are a mixture of good and evil. So that's why a good intention does not make a bad action good. Right. But a bad intention does make a good, good action, action evil. Bad. Yeah. So that's the second thing. So you have to have a good intention. So if the woman's saying, well, you know, I actually really do want to get rid of this child. So, you know, wink, wink, nod, nod. Mm -hmm. Well, that's sinful. Okay. The third thing, and this is uh, a little more complicated, but not, not too much. It's that the good effect uh, cannot come directly from the bad effect. Because yeah. if it does, then that means you actually want the bad effect. Right. So in the case we're talking about, 
if the baby does die, yeah. the health of the woman cannot be a consequence of the baby dying. Right. But just as it, it, the fact the baby dying is a side effect. Because you say, well, what difference does that make? The difference is that if you say, well, I have to kill the baby to save the woman, then you're actually directly and intentionally killing the baby. Right. Even if, well, you're intentionally at least, even if it's indirect. Mm -hmm. So if, if I say, you know, um, the only way for me to save my life is by denying Christ. Now, I don't really want to deny Christ, but I want to live. So, you know, I'm going to do it anyway. Well, the good effect, which is me living, comes from the bad effect. And so that's not allowable. Even if my intention is good that, you know, I don't really want to deny. Um, so that's the third thing. And the final thing is proportionality. Right. There has to be proportionality. In other words, the good effect has to be better than the bad effect is bad. And that's, you know, something that you weigh up and you say, well, um, you know, another Chesterton quote, you don't chop your head off to cure your headache. Yes. So uh, is that proportional? No, that's not proportional. Um, so I went on chemotherapy to cure my hay fever. Yeah. Well, that's not proportional. Mm -hmm. Uh, so is it proportional for me to risk the life of the baby in order to cure my cancer? And that's going to be a matter of prudence for you to decide based on your responsibilities towards perhaps other children, right. your husband, etc. Uh, the possibilities of the baby getting baptized, right. um, etc. So those four things. So if you apply that to the vaccine, okay, once you agree that it's not actually formal cooperation, and I know... Uh, people of, uh, you know, whom I respect say, well, it is formal cooperation, but actually they're not using the correct definition of formal cooperation. Say, well, hold on a second, you know, this guy's a priest or whatever. Yeah, uh, but, you know, without uh, demeaning in any way, it's the seminary formation that a lot of priests got was very, very defective. Good. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not saying my seminary formation was perfect, but it was very good yes. because it was in accordance with what the church always did. Yeah. And it was based on St. Thomas Aquinas. And... Uh, it's it's not it's not me just saying this, but this is you know the people formed in the traditional moral theology of the church. Mm -hmm. So that is not formal cooperation because if you were to get vaccinated, let's say, um, then you are are you agreeing with the abortion that took place? Clearly not. And are you sort of supplying something which, in other words, are you going to um, give something which is making this abortion happen in some way? No. So is it uh, materially cooperation? Yes, you apply the principles. And here I would say, uh, then it, it's a very, you're actually, we are actually facilitating the sort of whole industry by just accepting this vaccine. Mm -hmm. So I, my, my opinion is that in this case, the authority, which in this case I think would be the bishops perhaps of a country or yeah. the, the Pope, should actually declare a boycott yes. and say, sorry, we're not touching this. Yeah. Uh, it's not necessarily that we're against vaccines, but it's because we can have a vaccine that doesn't involve the abortion because this is so serious yes. that we're going to boycott. I think that's the correct thing to do. They should do that. Yeah, okay. I, th I believe so. So um, I'm just going to get the door quick. It's probably just a package. Hold on. Okay. Home office stuff. We just uh, got a package. <laughs> Excellent. So yes, the bishops should be uh, the bishops should because be it's so serious. Yeah, but they haven't. It's so serious. It's it's you know I don't think that you could say well, I mean it would have to be a very uh, Catholic and cohesive society that would say okay we're going to boycott this particular pharmacy mm -hmm. because they're selling immoral things. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that would be allowable, but yeah. it, it has to be a matter of prudence, depending on the circumstances. In this case, yeah. the the sort of abortion is becoming like a sacrament mm -hmm. for the yes. diabolical religion, and it is one of the sins crying out to heaven for vengeance. It's all part of the package of the world sort of descending into sort of a diabolical mindset. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the correct thing to do. That did not happen in the circumstances. So yeah. what do I, as an individual, do? Yeah. I have to say, well, I'm going to need to weigh up those four things. Is what I'm doing intrinsically evil? No, it's not formal cooperation. Is my intention good? Am I intending to support the abortion industry? No. Um, is the good effect coming from the bad effect? In other words, the good effect of why I want to take the vaccine, is that coming from the fact that 
the abortion industry was involved? No. Mm -hmm. What's the proportionality? And we're not talking about the proportionality with terms of, you know, are there risks for your health of taking the vaccine? We're talking about the moral proportionality. Yeah. And so there you have to say, well, in my circumstance, I'm going to lose my job. I'm not going to be able to keep my mortgage payments. You know, can we say that? No, I can't do that. In the absence of a boycott, I, I think that uh, that's a, that's a, you can do that. If I'm going to lose my kids because well, I Well, that was a real possibility. Vaccine, right. But, you know, I remember it was very dark before the, the Freedom Convoy, Trucker Convoy thing. I mean, it was like, it was very, very, it was very depressing uh, being here as an unvaccinated person. And my wife and I, one day we thought, and many, and you had talked to any traditional, any, any, any object, any, anyone who objected, any conscientious objector who has children living under this regime, which was very, very oppressive in many ways. And, and, and you talk to them and they'll all tell you that they, in the quiet of their mind, laying in bed at night, talking with their spouse, and they said, we're going to have to be careful because there may be a position where they come after the children. Okay. We, we thought that. I mean, it sounds crazy now. It does, yeah, yeah. But it was very dark. I mean, we're talking about September 19th, 2021 is Canada. September 20th, 2021 has more strict segregation laws than the Jim Crow South. Okay. I don't people yeah. thought of that. Yeah. In the Jim Crow South... Black people could have their own restaurants. Right. They could have their own schools, their own sports leagues. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In the Trudeau Crow, uh, you know, whatever, uh, you couldn't have any sports. You couldn't have any school. You couldn't have any restaurant. And it was very severe. In, in Quebec, at one stage, you couldn't either go to church yeah. or, horror of horrors, even go to the liquor store. Yeah. So it's, uh, so, if you weren't vaccinated. Yeah. So yeah. all these things are to say is, uh, the grave situation people are in is their own. It's their own. And you do not want, you do not want priests to become your, uh, scientist. There, there may yeah. be a priest who is a scientist. There have been many. There are many. And that's yeah. great. Okay. <laughs> in that situation, it's because of his, well, he's, you trust him if he's properly formed as a priest because he has a good education. For his moral advice. Right. But then he is also a scientist, which is helpful. Which has got nothing to do with being a priest, per exactly. se. Exactly. Yeah. But in this situation, I mean, you know, priests are reading this website, this website, whatever. Their opinion may be correct. It may be incorrect. You do not want to set the precedent where your priest is telling you whether or not you should be giving your children gluten-free food. Mm -hmm. And that might sound like, oh, I'm downplaying it, but I'm, I'm, it's the same realm of understanding of, this is something that medical professionals are divided on, and there are people of all different, uh, you know, uh, persuasions who are saying one way or the other. Some of them were very like Roberto de Matei, maybe the greatest book ever written on the Second Vatican Council. Maybe I mean him, Hildebrand, Chris Farrar, and Tom Woods. Pick, you know, they're all great, but an incredible traditional Catholic scholar. He was writing booklets supporting the vaccine in Italy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't understand it. But for some reason, he had a reason to do that. Anyway, so I, I think we've uh, we've covered that, but really it's going to be a, a... Yeah, I just want to make another yeah. point, Kennedy, if I could, because that's the moral aspect. And then the priest, people come to the priest and say, well, you know, can I take the vaccine? So that's, is it lawful? It depends. Yeah. Second thing, is it prudent? And that's where you say, well, you know, whoa, 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 whoa. Look at all of these things. Some people uh, say, you know, this vaccine is going to kill millions of people. Uh, others say, well, uh, you know, it's uh, not safe. Others say, no, it's very safe. Yeah. So it's not really up to the priest to say, yeah, let me tell you about all of the medical consequences. What the priest should say is, you need to see if this is prudent. Because, you know, for example, a new vaccine, which is untested, yeah. it may be better to wait. Well, it's just until generally speaking, that's general prudent thing to do. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So the priest should say that, but it's not up to him to make the decision. Yes. And so this is the beauty of the correct understanding of church and state is that the state is subordinate to the church. Yes. That means that in matters of faith and morals, the state defers to the church. Right. But it's never been, and once again, this is the attribution of the actions of heretics to Catholics, it's never been a case where, oh yeah, the priest just told us to do everything. Yeah. Like they made all the decisions. Okay, you're in, you may have a crazy priest uh, once in a while who tries to sort of, you know, tell everybody that they have to use no-name toothpaste or yeah. drink smoothies or whatever it might be. But 
that's none of his business. No. It's none of his business. And so it, it would be stupid for us to come out and saying, yeah, look, the SSPX in conscience recommends that you can't take Pfizer, but you can take whatever. Whatever, yeah. Um, so, no, the SSPX says, okay, here are the moral uh, guidelines, just mm-hmm. as we do in everything else. Mm-hmm. So we say, you know, uh, father, is it lawful? You know, is it? Can I marry, uh, you know, Sabrina? So I said, well, is it lawful? Uh, are there any impediments? Mm-hmm. Are you free to marry? Mm-hmm. Is it prudent? And then you make the decision. The priest yes. can't say, okay, I've decided who's marrying who here. Yeah. He can't <laughs> so, say, well, you know, I, I don't like her personality. I don't think yeah. it fits with yours. But That's you, not, you, yeah. you, you say it. You, you, and of course, I've, I've done this many times, is you say to them, look, at, you need to consider these things because, you know, if you're getting married to somebody, you need to have somebody who's going to be solid, who's going to help you get to heaven, right? You know, does this person have these qualities? But it's not up for me to say, yes, yeah, you can marry him yeah. or you can't marry him. Right. And so what I was advising the priests in the Canadian district at the time was to say, you know, in the pulpit, we give moral guidance on the vaccine. Each of us has personal opinions. I think it's perfectly fine for us to speak about those on a one-to-one basis, but not to sort of promote these personal opinions as if it were somehow the teaching of the church. Yeah. And uh, and that's why uh, the the cuz it let's uh, let's take a in reverse. Let's say that the SSPX had taken a position on the vaccine saying, "Yeah, everybody has to get vaccinated." Well, we would have immediately sort of isolated a whole group of our parishioners. Mm-hmm. Or if we had taken a position to say, "Oh no, no, no." You cannot get vaccinated. That's a mortal sin. Then we would have isolated another another set of it's our also parishioners. Not true. Now so, it's it's yeah. not it's not that you you shouldn't isolate in certain circumstances. Yes. Because when it really is a matter of yes, this is true mm-hmm. and this is false, and you have to teach the truth, then clearly those who go away go away, and yeah. you can't sort of hide the truth depending on that. But when it's a matter that is not actually a matter of intrinsic good or evil, but something which depends on the circumstances. Mm-hmm. Then you, you you don't you don't get involved. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we have ten minutes left. Okay, so I'll ask you the toughest question. Um, one of the objections people have with the Society of Saint Pius X is about abuse allegations. Right. Um, I'll give quick little preamble here on my experience with being a teacher and receiving training about how to deal with minors versus my experience having done some work with the SSPX dealing with minors. I will say my training with the SSPX, I was coaching and things like that, you know, yes. mm-hmm. was much more thorough than it was when I was a teacher. Um, I was actually very impressed by it, if I'm being honest. Um, that my experience with the boys' camp, um, the supervision has been extraordinary. There's many, many counselors compared to other camps. I mean, it's like two or three boys per a counselor almost. Uh, there's never a alone time. I mean, all the all the my experience has been. I was coaching many sports. I was teaching classrooms with kids from kindergarten all the way through through high school. And I've never seen in personal experience this much diligence with dealing with minors. But of course, there have been, um, in the in the 50-year history, there have been uh, the odd instance of a derelict priest doing something horrible. As their Judas is alive. He's always alive, you know? Yep. But the people will, but the, but the accusation by the critics of the SSPX is cover up and, you know, uh, you know, basically the SSPX is just a very uh, shady, corrupt organization mm-hmm. that doesn't mm-hmm. uh, deal with pedophiles and so on and so forth. And yep. So what, what do we make of that? No, uh, that's a very, a very good point because you're, you're right. There are uh, former priests of the Society of St. by Stent who were a society priests at the time yeah. who have been convicted of uh, crimes and are now in prison or have yeah. spent time in prison. And that is the correct thing to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea that the church is sort of, you know, I, I'm not talking about the SSPX here, but the church is, you know, fundamentally corrupt is is not true yeah. because the constitution of the church and with all due proportion, the constitution of the Society of the Bias X mm-hmm. is good and seeks the good. But the church and the Society of the Pius X is composed of sinful men who are more or less sinful. Right. And some, and we all know, uh, life is a story. Uh, if you choose to be unfaithful to the grace of your vocation as a baptized person, or as a priest, or as a married person, uh, there is no level of evil to which you might not descend. Right. Uh, plug for Father Brown's stories. I forget which one this was, but... Uh, Father Brown says that, you know, there is no, you can never say, I think it's to Flambeau, uh, you can never say that I'm going to keep at this level of good. 
you have to be striving for the best because otherwise there's no level you can't descend to. Right. Okay. So, um, so th- that that's the the background. So there are uh, there are priests who who have been convicted of these things and rightly so, and they're in prison. And this was the traditional attitude of the church. Mm-hmm. I think it was the Council of Trent in one of its disciplinary canons said that if any cleric is found now not just allegations but uh, is you know convicted substantial yeah, yeah. substantial allegations mm-hmm. is convicted of a uh, crime against the sixth commandment with a minor he is to be reduced from the from the clerical state so he's to be stripped of the of the power insofar as it's possible yep. because was your priest forever but he's to be stripped of all the dignities and handed over to the civil power to be punished mm-hmm. okay Vatican II, post-Vatican II, 60s, sexual revolution. Um, this New turned into, Canada. well, you yeah. know, uh, free love, etc. Yeah. This is, uh, sexuality is just uh, an expression. It's not something which, once again, has to be controlled by right reason mm-hmm. in accordance with God, but rather it's more of an expression of, in the past, the church repressed all these things, and so it has to be now. And so... When people think of this uh, this abuse allegations, in fact, the the research shows that um, sexual abuse, unfortunately, did sort of blossom after, let's say, the sexual revolution, uh, the sixties, etc. And there was a different attitude. It well, was, of course it was it no did. longer hey, let's punish this yeah. this wrongdoer. It, the attitude was more, you know, well, you know, this is not very good, so we're gonna, you know, perhaps wrap them, mm. tap them over the wrists a little bit or whatever but we're not really going to do anything. Um, whereas I think now in the last, let's say the church or the world in general, maybe in the last 20, 25 years, sees that this is there's a serious problem that needs to be tackled here. So I can only speak of what I know, which is that the SSPX in Canada, I'm the, obviously I'm the person responsible in Canada for the enforcement of uh, child uh, protection, as it's now called. And in Canada, we do have uh, stringent protocols. I'm just going to explain them briefly, which is if anybody, whether it be a priest or a, a lay person, is going to be dealing with children or vulnerable adults, um, obviously somebody can be a visitor and just be be there and accompanied, but and accompanied, uh, or also if they're going to work, we have to know them for at least six months. You can't just show up and say, I'm going to help out at the children's camp. We have to have uh, vet them, so mm-hmm. ch- criminal record checks or vulnerable sector checks, as they're called. We have to get references. This applies to priests and and people. And then there are all the rules of prudence with children. Yep. So you know you don't don't be alone with the child. You only have appropriate contact. Yep. Uh, so, Segregation of the sexes and right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. putting your 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 hand on on a child's shoulder to direct him or to comfort him, obviously fine. Yeah. But inappropriate contact. We all know what that would be. I mean, right. you, it's it's a question of prudence. Don't be alone with children. If you have a couple of adults around who are both vetted, or if there were a circumstance, and this is where I think, you know, prudence comes in. You know, I do remember, for example, a circumstance where, you know, one of these things happen. You're at school, and then somebody breaks his leg and has to go to the hospital. And then mm-hmm. 10 minutes later, somebody else does something, has to go to the hospital as well. You're running short of staff. So one adult has to go on his own. You get bring an extra young person in there you drive off down the road and you put the parents on on on, on the speakerphone mm. just letting you know what's happening mm. i'm here i'm with bob I also brought along a pat mm. you know it's yeah above board yeah it's it's open there's nothing and that's how it, that's how i've seen it operate and that's how it should operate yeah. now what happens in a case where uh, somebody is accused of something because clearly an accusation is not proof mm. now i think perhaps in the past and i'm not talking about the sspx in particular here but in the past, people would say, well, it's just an accusation, okay? And so nothing perhaps was done because there was talk going around that perhaps such so-and-so uh, had done such and such, but it was unsubstantiated. So now, I suppose we have learned from experience because the world we're living in is more and more corrupt. And so there can be, within even within the, the halls of Catholicism and the halls of traditionalism, there can be corrupt People can be anywhere because yeah. we're we're, uh, we're we're sinners mm-hmm. and uh, there is no level you cannot descend to. Uh, so I've got a protocol to follow, which I clearly obviously followed, yeah. uh, which is okay. You don't investigate yourself. Yeah. The person adult who's been accused, just out of out of caution, you remove them from contact with children. Mm-hmm. 
uh, we're not saying the person is guilty because we don't that know would clearly be, yeah. be unfair. Because yeah. uh, okay. there are such things as, as unfair uh, accusations. So the idea, believe the victim, if the victim's telling the truth, yes. But out of justice, you have to say, well, we need to investigate. But our policy, and we've had it in place for many years, is that, well, in this case, it's a child, you've got to call children's services. Now, that's not something that we would do lightly, uh, because, but it's a legal obligation in the circumstances that we, we have an actual accusation of abuse. Children's services are going to come. They're going to have to investigate. And that's the way to get to the bottom of things. The way to get to the bottom of things is not to say, okay, we've heard this. Let's put it on the internet. Yeah. Okay. Why? Because if there is a problem, in order to avoid uh, detraction or calumny, mm-hmm. okay, now let, let's face it that uh, until we know for sure this might not be true. Yep. Until we know for sure that it is true, it might not be true. Mm-hmm. And the way to get to the bottom of it is, is to report to the person who can do something about it. Mm-hmm. And in the world in which we live, in which the church no longer has powers of coercion, mm-hmm. physical coercion, back in the old days, the bishop would have his police man yep. that he would send down to arrest you. Mm-hmm. But now they, they were, were back to the situation where, in fact, well, the person who can do something about it, that's the police. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, so if there's an accusation... It's a, it's an accusation that is made. You don't know if it's true or not, yeah. but the person is making it. Well, go to the police. Mm-hmm. Okay, you. Uh, we ask. We do not enforce, but we ask simply that. Let's say in one of our schools or camps, etc. And you know this from your training. We ask simply that when you acquit yourself of your obligation to report, that you inform mm-hmm. the local superior out of courtesy, obviously. But it's not an obligation. Yeah. Uh, but it's that that's how it operates and that's how and I know for sure because obviously there have been cases going around um I know a case in in uh in not too far in the past for example where a person came forward against a priest in the society before my time as district superior but came forward as a priest uh, against a priest in society with a, an accusation okay this people are saying oh the SSPX has been covering this up for years well in fact because I needed to know some details on this. I called up our superior general and I said, you know, uh, what's going on here? So, and he, he explained, well, as soon as we got the accusation, we put the process into operation. Uh, it's, it's, it's a fact that these allegations go back years, but I mean, what are we going to do if we don't know about them? Yeah. What we are doing is we're saying, okay, well, every priest has to have a criminal record check every three years. But if he doesn't have a criminal record, <clears throat> it doesn't come up on the check. Exactly. Yeah. So, in other words, you can't sort of say that, uh, that you know, this is never going to happen. Mm-hmm. Because you can't have universal supervision of every action. Imagine if on your camp... and. Actually, when I was when I was in a school, uh, you know, people, some people were suggesting, you know, we need to have security cameras everywhere. And I said, no, you're going to ruin the school. Yeah, you can't. If you give the kids the the idea that they're constantly being watched, then all you're going to do is to school them to be conformists. Yes. What you actually have to do is saying you're not being watched, but I trust you. Yeah. And of course, some kids are going to fail, but then you you learn from that. Yeah. We go through, it and we, I trust you again because yeah. you've, and that's how you form. So I think that's the thing is that. Uh, you know, in this case, for example, uh, as soon as we know that's an allegation, priest is taken out of of, of contact uh, with children. Well, why did you leave him there until then? Well, we didn't know. We didn't know. So what are you going to do? Now, I, I clearly can't speak for all of the cases because there are cases where priests are are in jail, yeah. and rightly so. Mm-hmm. It is. I think it's it's very important to do so. Because once you explain to people, yeah, this is a priest who's done something bad. There are priests throughout history have done bad things in all sorts of, in all sorts of endeavors. Because priests are sinners too, and they can go to the devil. Yeah. Um, that you know, this is not uh, you know the the Catholic Church which has done this. Mm-hmm. This is this individual, and he needs to be punished. And then yeah. when people when people uh, see that the priest is being punished, they're in fact reassured. And in the case, I'll just finish off the story I was telling about the the allegation that was made to me. So uh, in this case, the uh, children's services in- investigated with the police. They came back and said, there's no crime being committed here. And we do not uh, make any recommendation about uh, whether this person can continue or not. So he was he you. was given a clean yeah. uh, clean break. He, he was given a clean b- bill of health yeah. to to by the police. And then I remember afterwards uh, calling the children around and saying, 
you know, this is what happened because obviously they need to know mm -hmm. because they know some things. Say, look at you know, we we treat this seriously. Uh, if you uh, you know, we do not tolerate you being abused or maltreated or whatever. I forget my words exactly, but you know, made it clear and it was obvious to them as well that you're not going to get away with a false accusation. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, kids are kids, humans are humans. Yep. You can make false accusations. And so this was was a good outcome. Um, so it was a good outcome because it showed that, yeah, the SSPX is serious. And the Spirit General told me that, you know, all you hear about all these allegations out in the, in the media, perhaps. Um, in fact, everything that we know is known to the police. There's nothing that is sort of, you know, the SSPX is hiding something. Yep. It's the correct thing to do when there's an allegation is to go to somebody who can actually has the power to do something about it, which in this case is the police. Mm -hmm. The church has the power to enforce canonical penalties. Yeah. So they also, there can be a canonical trial, but um, to coerce and to actually punish the malefactor, which is necessary for the common good of society, mm -hmm. then you go to the police. And that's that's where the society has never said, you know, oh, well, uh, you know, don't go to the police. No. It's it's everything that no. it, that accusation that's made it's the police are aware of it and yeah and and i'll uh i'll finish off this um this idea too because i was a teacher as i said and i coached sports and um i knew that if i was ever falsely accused of something and it got out it wouldn't matter if it was true or not i'd be done uh so there is a real sensitivity there yeah you know no one's ever going to let you coach their kids again if it was a lie, even even if even if it's proven that's a lie, well, you know, how do we know it's really a lie? No smoke without fire, you know. And 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 fairness, that's a, an abundance of caution is important. Mm. But you will ruin people's lives if you're wrong. And that's why you need to have a really robust but fair. Yes. In other words, yes. we're not going to ignore your allegations. Yes. But Over it's going to be investigated by the proper authority who can yeah. do something about it. It's not going to be investigated in the court of the internet. Yeah. Um, it's going to be properly done. And so when people, when that sort of gets out there though, then people begin to trust that system. Mm -hmm. Then, because otherwise, let's say if you, you don't really know what's going on, are you really going to send your kids to the yeah. camp? Yeah. You know, if, if there's all these question marks, and that's why I want to, I'm glad of this opportunity to, to reassure people that I know for sure that if something comes across my desk tomorrow morning, somebody calls me, you know, I can. You're going to follow the proper I channels. I can't live with my conscience no. by just trying to put this under the carpet. No. And the media people need to understand. I'm a journalist. I've, you know, I've, I've, um, again, like I always say, just because someone's a conservative or traditional Catholic, they might be right on doctrine, but it doesn't mean they're right on their opinions. And that's correct. Yes. And I've seen this, and I won't mention the media organizations because it creates a firestorm, and it's I don't want that. Whatever my personal life. Um, I've, when there was a lot of the information against the SSPX the last couple of years, I read some of it and some of it was just incorrect. Like I investigated, looked up statements by lawyers, like there was fudging around with dates. Um, mm -hmm. And then some of it was, okay, they went to St. Mary's, Kansas, and they talked to somebody from St. Mary's, Kansas. And that person from St. Mary's, Kansas did say X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. But I also just went to St. Mary's, Kansas mm -hmm. and talked to people who knew the families. And they mm -hmm. said... We know that person is lying and everyone here knows they're lying. And all of their family members said the opposite. Okay. So yes, did they report something? You have to understand, you look at journalism. Did they report, did their source tell them something? Yes. They're not lying. Their source did tell them something. Mm -hmm. Is their source uh, correct? Mm -hmm. Well, now you have to go deeper. Yeah. And there's a lot of that in journalism. You have to be careful. Mm -hmm. And I would also say that in general, when, let's say, I know, you know, you think of, uh, Doug Ford and the uh, Rob Ford and the you know the the caught cooking with her crack cocaine crack cocaine, cocaine etc. Yeah. And you think you know this was a big splash in the Toronto Star or whatever the Sun whatever it yeah. was. I think well, if if somebody is accused of something and you're not sure, but you as a journalist you uh, you've had the accusation, I believe that the correct thing to do is to not print it and go to the police. Yes, because then. They can actually, they've got the authority yeah. to investigate. You do not have any authority to investigate. And so you're saying, well, we're trying to hold these people accountable. But actually, this is a bit of the myth of journalism. Yes. The myth of journalism is that, you know, we're here as the high priests of we're the, society. We're the arbiters of truth for all to know. That's whatever. right. Yeah. yeah. And so, but in fact, no, there, there is somebody who does have that power. That person's called a judge. Yes. And the uh, executive power has an arm called the police force yeah. to investigate it. And the church 
traditionally, of course, has the power to investigate crimes by the clergy, yeah. reference St. Thomas of Becket. But yes. uh, in reality now, uh, very wisely, the church says, well, we're going to waive that because this is so important. We do not actually have the power. Yeah. I mean, in Vatican City, they have the power, yeah. but that's it. So we do not actually have the power. Therefore, we're turning all of this over to the civil authorities. Now, once again, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, in society in general, the idea was more, well, you, you can know, treat them as well. There was an idea yeah. that you could treat pedophiles and things like that. Yeah. You know. Which is which is probably there's an element to that because of course there's something messed up. There's in a their, trauma in their or psyche. something perhaps yeah. they might have been abused. But it's it's know. not the, it, the thing is that this is a crime yeah. which is you know in a sense crying out to heaven for vengeance as well, and so it needs to be uh, shown that it's going to be punished okay. because that's the only thing that somebody who's got a compulsion of this sort may understand. There was a and we'll finish with this here because I think my I think my children are going to come storming in the door soon. Um, I was talking to someone recently and uh there was some abuse before the council obviously there's always been problems it exploded after the council because the norms changed but there was some oh yeah and, there and, always has been and there was but and that's why there was legislation that's what exactly uh so Pius XII sent basically some to investigate in America and he wrote a report which apparently you can still find I haven't found it yet uh but he said something to the effect of basically these men have to be put on an island in the middle of shark infested waters, there's just mm. no reforming them. Right. And that's, he, he said, there's just something broken right. about this person. And, uh, society has kind of forgotten that in many mm -hmm. ways. Yeah. And it's, uh, compassion overrides the judgment or the, the, okay. the justice. And also this is slightly off topic, but we've actually, society has today put in place all of the elements necessary for completely and utterly condoning and legalizing pedophilia right. in years to come, because we've put into place the idea that all sexual expression is good. Yeah. Whatever it is. And secondly, children have the ability and the right to choose for themselves from the youngest age what their gender is. So why can't they choose? Well, that's other that, things. It's, it's going to happen genitalia. because because the thing is that yep. is that false principles. If you accept them, they work their way out. You can't stop it. It's like getting on the top of a slide yep. and saying, you know, we're going to head off, but we're not going to get to the bottom. You can't actually stop getting to the bottom. And so that's why it's it's going to happen. So that's why I think we need to do is we need to. Uh, we need to, um, you know, the, the church needs to say, okay, there are priests who are evildoers. They will be punished and they're not going to be uh, sort of trusted because, as you say, they can't something be wrong. trusted. Yeah. But we need to also help them save their souls. That's right. Because they can still save their souls. Yeah. And uh, we need to also, if there have been bishops, for example, who have acted in a lily-livered way yeah. because they were afraid to... Um, you know, discipline individuals, whatever else. Well, that's unacceptable from a leader, yep. from a bishop. And so he needs to be also, uh, depending on the severity of what he's done, he needs to be, you know, removed and somebody who's willing to come in and actually execute justice. Because that's the whole role of the Pope and the bishops and any sort of ruler. His thing is, I need to execute justice and I need to vindicate truth. And there also has to be a distinction made between cover-up and mistake. Okay. People can, like, again, I remember, and those, ladies and gentlemen, those are not my kids or the neighbor's kids you can hear screaming, yelling. My kids are perfectly behaved. Um, and they're probably just having fun anyway. But um, <laughs> when I was, you know, I was a teacher, again, my principal, I, I had to bring some stuff to him. Yeah. And there were certain things where he's like, I don't know up or down on this. Mm -hmm. And he made mistakes. Yeah. He made mistakes. I mean, he's in a leadership position. He has a limited amount of information that has to do with the welfare of kids. And he's getting two stories from both sides. And he's not really sure what to do. Mm -hmm. That's not a cover-up, though. Yeah. I think that's that's true. Is that, And this is true of, of, let's say, parents or teachers in general, is that you're constantly interacting with your children. So you're going to make mistakes. Yes. But that's not the same thing as some sort of conspiracy whereby my parents actually were always trying yeah. to cruelly mistreat me. Now, that's why I think you need to have a playbook. Yes. So in other words, where and this is what what the what we need is where do you cross the line? Okay? So if for example, uh, you know, a teacher loses their temper and shouts at the child, do we report that? Yeah. Well, if it's a one off occasion and, you know, whatever the circumstances, well no, probably yeah. not. But it crosses a line where you say, well, this sort of behavior is actually that crosses the line. And this is our playbook. We we are going to call up children's services. Yeah. 
And clearly, you don't want to call children's services when it's not justified, yeah. okay? Because you're going to waste their time and you're also going to waste everybody's time and it's not necessary. But where there is actually, for example, sexual abuse, I mean, you can't not do it. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, I think that um, we need to uh, follow those rules, follow those principles. Uh, we need to also reassure parents and say, look at, you know, if you have any questions, I would say, about any of this, you, if you're thinking of entrusting your children to a, a priest because he's running a school or he's running a camp, you have a right to get some answers on this. Yeah. So go, go and see him. Yeah. Go and see him. Because you're responsible ultimately for entrusting your kids. So if if you think no this is this is uh this is not uh, right then you need to to make that decision. Right. So go and talk to them. Go right. and get some answers. You're not happy? You're not happy. Right. Well, I think we've solved all the world's problems. Um so I think this is a good place to end it. Um So thank you Father for coming on. This has been wonderful. Um and I hope people out there who are uh, wondering about the SSPX and all the things they've heard. I hope these are sufficient answers. I hope they are. Um, for those who want more in-depth information, I'm going to have the thing on my screen. I'll make it bigger so you can see it. My book, SSPX, The Defense, is available. Um, about more of the detailed theological, canonical kind of stuff. But the SSPX as a whole, as a society of priests... I am eternally grateful for having interacted with priests such as yourself and everyone else in the society because especially here in Canada it is a it is a liturgical wasteland. Uh, Canada is very bad. I mean I love my country uh but uh you know it's 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 pretty far few and far between in this place for good traditional Catholicism even just conservative Catholicism. So I'm extremely grateful. So I really thank you for taking this time and for all the work that you've done and I know you've only got a few months left here in Canada. So may you eat as much poutine as possible, <laughs> uh, except on Fridays, I guess. Um, and, and, uh, and not die of a heart attack. And not have a heart attack. <laughs> thank you very much for inviting me, Kennedy. And I'd like to also just thank you for the work that you do in um, just explaining the position of the Society of St. Pius X and explaining how the Society of St. Pius X is neither in schism nor a sect. Right. Um, and that's, that's the thing I, I would say to people very clearly, you know, uh, if the Society of St. Pius X turns into a sect or actually goes into schism, I'll be out of here tomorrow. Me too. So, yeah. you know, this is this is really a blessing from God that Archbishop Lefebvre um, gave us simply the rules of prudence in a time of crisis. Right. And it's, it's tough on us yeah. because we're living through it and it's going on. But it's such a blessing right. because when I see not just your kids, but I see these beautiful families with young, innocent kids, eyes alive. Yeah. And I think to myself, 